This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is the number one mentoring program that teaches you e-commerce from scratch. Change has a real community with real results. I have been working with Ryan for many years now and have attended many of his events and retreats across the world and got to meet members and the amazing community of like-minded people. Ryan works with a lot of big names in the business world, helping them build online businesses and e-commerce. Change offers personal one-on-one support, no experience needed, but like anything, this takes time and is not a get-rich-quick scheme. If you put the work in, you will get the results. E-commerce and online shopping is getting bigger and bigger. This is a great opportunity for anyone that is looking for financial freedom. For more information, go follow Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help you get started and build a successful online business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And today's guest will be Dan Davis. Dan, how are we? Not too bad, James. How are you? Really good. First and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. Not at all. Book offer, but the book that will plug straight away that you wrote, In Plain Sight, The Life and Lies of Jimmy Savile. For me, one of the most evil men in the UK who was never convicted. Untouchable, possibly, with his people who rubbed shoulders with. But people are still fascinated with this stuff and this man, for some reason, never charged. Apparently 500 victims majority under 18 like you lived it first hand with the guy for a few years to kind of understand him and it's a uh, yeah listen powerful book I read like I says earlier I read snippets just to get an understanding of it myself I don't know anyone I know Elu Faroo kind of done the documentary and, um, and yourself who were yeah with the man but how are you? I'm all right yeah I'm not too bad I mean it's sort of it feels like a long time ago, but it also feels quite present. Yeah. You know, the, the the BBC drama that's based on the book, The Reckoning, came out last October, and that sort of stirred a lot of still waters. You know, it's like, I think having been in this story and agonized over it for a long time and not got to the truth while he was alive because he did evade the truth or he did evade capture very successfully for more than 84 years um so yeah it's it was you know when they when the tv drama came out and the build-up to that it sort of as i said it stirred some still waters and and it sort of made me think about a time in my life which i sort of tried to put behind me to be honest with you yeah but it's difficult because of that name and the no charges and the reputation that he had and it by the looks of it fooled so many people and people have got to understand, not everyone who was photoed with Jimmy Savile or with Jimmy Savile are in, hard in the same brush as him because he, he seemed very cunning, very narcissistic um, and very capable of manipulation anyone. So it's, uh, yeah, it'll be an interesting podcast. But first and foremost, where can people buy the book? Well, you can get it on Amazon, see most good bookshops. You know, it's still it's still out there. It's still selling. Um you know, it's a book I'm very proud of. It took me it took me a long time to write. I was interviewing him for a number of years. I think six years in total, maybe more than six years. Up and you know, from you know, in his late life, up until probably about just under a year before he died. Um, and in that time, you know, I really agonised over what this story was. You know, I mean, I was, I was not obsessed by Jimmy Savile, but I was very interested in him from a very early age because you know I went to see Jim will fix it being filmed when I was nine years old with my best mate my mum took me and my best mate to Shepherd's Bush TV theatre and we were sitting in the audience we never met him and you know I was staying with my that best mate last night actually and we talk about it 
we have talked about it quite a lot because we both came away from that episode feeling like god there was something really cold and remote and odd about him and at that time you know 1980 he was one of the biggest celebrities in britain and he was seen as you know almost like a santa claus to the nation with jim will fix it and programs like that and his fame was huge and he was a huge charity fundraiser but there was just and i don't know whether it was you know what i describe as the sort of unvarnished reality of tv you know which as a kid you're seeing lots of adults running around with clipboards and you know headphones on and you're looking through the tv cameras there's wires everywhere and it's not what you see when you're a kid sitting on the sofa watching the tv show but something really sort of shone out or was quite visceral if you like from that that experience and that was the fact that he was very cold and remote and there was some real oddness about him and that started that started the journey it wasn't like i went off and started obsessing about jimmy savile straight away but that was definitely the seed i think back then though when people were famous they were famous and it doesn't matter who you are even though you'd have probably felt that kind of weird energy the coldness like you say because they're famous we put these people on pedestals where you kind of bypass everything that you're feeling and kind of just see them as wouldn't say gods but idols no matter who it is or their backstory even though a lot of people didn't know his backstory then, but I believe obviously the 50s he was kind of getting um, exposed. But yeah, a weird character. But again, Netflix documentaries, doc, more books. He will always be spoke about, I believe, because there'll never ever be any answers to it now. So it's a lot of it's speculation, a lot of it is hearsay, and a lot of it is people's opinions. But it's just so much dirt against the guy. And it, it, like I say, we'll get into all that, how he managed to work his way around it all without ever getting convicted. But before we get into everything, though, Dan, I always like to go back to the start with my guests. Get my, more of a bit of an understanding about you, where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I grew up in London, uh, one of four kids, um, quite young parents. Uh, went to school in London, wanted to be a sort of sportsman, I think. Was never quite good enough, but loved sport. And my first job in journalism was writing about sport. What sport? Golf to start with. I love golf. and I, I wrote to a load of fo- uh, sports magazines when I left school. Uh, football, golf, all the sort of sports I loved, really. And was lucky enough that, um, you know, somebody gave me a chance. And that was the start of my journalism career. And then I did that for a year before going to university at Liverpool. And then did football fanzines and freelance for people during university. And then went back to the golf magazine during my sort of universities from uh, holidays from universities, rather. And that was it. And then, and then worked in worked on football magazines during the nineties, and then in sort of men's magazines during the two thousands. Uh, and was sort of in and around that sort of loaded era when I was on the football magazine. So loaded was all starting up at IPC magazines in London. So it was an exciting time. Um, and then sort of moved into newspapers and you know away from sport and more into interviewing people and writing sort of longer form features. So that was it really. Trying sports change now, or are we just getting older back in the day? It just seemed more glorious. There was something about it. I always talk about the Premiership back in the day, and it was like your Patrick Vieira's, your Roy Keane's, your Eric Cantona's. Uh, that's just how I remember football. It was dirty, it was just, it was tough. It just seems now when you look at sports stars, I don't know if, like I say, because I'm getting older and I've interviewed a lot of people, it doesn't have the same kind of feel to it. But back then, even when you were watching the golf and the Grand Prix, Italian football there was just something magical about your weekends yeah it was amazing I mean I you know it was the next best thing to to playing top level sport was writing about it and I was very fortunate that you know covered world cups and interviewed loads of great footballers and golfers and sports stars and worked in Australia for a year on a sports magazine and you know interviewed rugby players and Aussie rules players and all that sort of stuff and you know just had a lot of amazing experiences was very sort of experience rich but cash poor and i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily um swap any of those experiences but yeah i mean i think football was different wasn't it and i i found a load of copies of the magazine i used to work for goal magazine on online recently and bought a load of copies and i've forgotten that i used to ghostwrite gareth southgate's column for um for goal magazine so yeah i mean like and just some of the stuff we did, like, you know, going up to the old firm Derby or going away with England to places like Moldova and Albania and, you know, Rome and following my team, Liverpool, you know, all over Europe and 
and all over Britain. Um, so yeah, I had a lot of good times with sport, and then you know a lot of good times on on men's magazines as well, which is where you know in two thousand and four the first first sort of interview with Savile happened. So yeah, I mean the the always love to write. You know, been very fortunate in my career. I've been you know one to be given the opportunity by people in the first place as a sort of raw nineteen year old. Um, and then just fell in love with it. And it's just been, you know, sort of my passion ever since and something that you get better at as you get older, I think. And I think that the, the book is, is still the best thing I've ever done. I'm very proud of it, even if the subject matter is, is painful, you know, not least for the people who are, who sort of, you know, the abuse they've faced is, is covered in the book. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it was something that was, exciting to write if you like because i knew it was good when i was writing it not because you know excited it sounds almost wrong that but I, I knew what i was writing was really good and it was really coming together and it took me a very long time it was almost like one of those magic eye pictures you know you look at and you have to make your eyes relax to see the picture come through mm -hmm. and that was almost a process of sort of seeing my way through this story and i had to sort of step away from it at times because it became very frustrating because he was like I, I described him as as it was trying to get to the real Jimmy Savile was like trying to nail smoke to the wall. He was a very elusive, very slippery, uh, very evasive character. Yeah, like you say with the book, this book will be studied for many many years, I believe, because you're the last one basically to then cover stories on him. So it's understandable how you're proud of it, and people might think, oh yeah. It's weird, it's Jimmy Savile, but I understand that it's your, your creative mindset of interviews and this, and with his kind of status, it's understandable, but it is a dark book as well, where yeah. it takes you on twists and turns, trying to understand basically the devil, and you've went first hand and, and try to do that, so you've got to kind of commend that with, it's a fucking brave thing to do as well, because you must be thinking, what's people going to say? Stepping away from it, coming back, should I do it, should I not do it? Was there ever any hesitation or did you just believe, okay, this is my chance, I need to do it? Well, it wasn't really about a chance. I think it was about the instinct that like there was, here was a guy who was one of the most famous, instantly recognisable people in Britain and nobody knew who he was. And that I just thought was so interesting in itself. And, you know, everything that he did, you know, the way he dressed, the way he had his hair, you know, the way he acted, he was like, I mean, I've always described him as, as this sort of heat seeking missile for publicity. He just, he craved publicity. He craved attention. You know, that sort of narcissism that we were talking about earlier. Yet nobody knew who he was. He was completely shut off. He was completely, he completely, uh, you know, the way I describe it in the book is he sort of bricked himself in, inside this facade. And the facade was the tracksuits, the jewelry, the hair the mad sort of catchphrases, the sort of mad cat behavior. But that was the front and nobody knew what lay beyond it. And that's what I was really trying to get to. And I think that you, you mentioned celebrity. And I think that, you know, my, my contention is that, that Jimmy Savile was almost the first British celebrity in the sense that he was famous for being famous. He wasn't famous for any great skill. And he said this himself. He wasn't a singer. He wasn't a dancer. He didn't right he didn't make the music he played the music and he never had any of the music in his house so it wasn't like it didn't even like feel like he was that passionate about it but that's what made his name but he was famous for being famous and that you know that start of that process of becoming a celebrity almost was the beginning beginning i think of the celebrity age that we now live in so even you've done your first interview with him did you feel that same presence as you did when you were nine years old? Or did that kind of change because his character changed? Because like you say, it was like a costume. Putting a costume on, the, the weird hair, the jewellery, the vests. That is creepy now. I've said it before, but you should never judge a book by its cover. But you can fucking judge him because he just looks wrong. Well, everybody, you know, when I when I was growing up in the, you know, was born in 1970, went to school in the 70s and 80s. And it was common chat in the playground that, you know, Jimmy Savile was a pedo. You know, he liked kids. He, he, he you know, had, had this thing about corpses or dead bodies, all this sort of stuff. That Those rumours were commonplace. So it wasn't like something that came out of left field. Um, when I went to interview him in 2004, there was a bit of preamble. I mean, I, I 
had been interested in him for a long time by that point. And I sort of collected newspaper cuttings and stories and stuff like that. And it almost become a bit of a sort of, you know, I'd almost become a sort of standing joke for my sort of Jimmy Savile knowledge. And I used to sort of half jokingly refer to the dossier. And within that sort of dossier were these cuttings and his autobiography from 1974 and other very odd books that he'd written. And anybody who'd sort of read all that stuff like I had could see that there were all these weird themes like power, like um, this sort of narcissism, this constant reference to like young kids and the fun that he had with them. Um, money, you know, status. He never laughed at himself. He was always, as I said, he was sort of, he was beyond the reach of understanding who he was. So I brought all that to the interview. And I remember I, I was working on a men's magazine in the, at the time, and I think his name had came up and I just started sort of spouting what I knew, you know, like his connections with the Royals, the fact that he was so tight with Thatcher, the, the fact that you know, he he had the keys to Broadmoor, all these sorts of themes, the fact that he, you know, addressed the Israeli parliament on a visit to to Tel Aviv and, and like all these sort of mad stories. And like the editor said, Well look, go and go and interview him. And like somebody had his phone number. I I left a message on his answer phone. A few days later I got this phone call back. Hello, is that the fearless reporter? And it was like, I'm oh, like, shit, it's Jimmy Savile on the phone and this is this is on. This is real. And I went up to Leeds and he, he insisted that I had to bring him three cigars of a certain type, which I had to go to some shop in central London to buy. And that was the sort of, that was his fee, if you like, for the interview. And I arrived at his flat in Leeds overlooking Round Hay Park. And he was in the penthouse flat. And he said, wait there. And I went, he, he buzzed me into the lobby and I was sitting in this sort of, standing in the lobby and like this sort of little tiny lift came down and he opened, the lift doors opened. And there was two quite big guys in there, I don't know, 50s or 60s or whatever, but quite big guys and Savile behind them. And this big sort of plume of cigar smoke came out of the lift and he went frisk, frisk him. And I was put against the wall by these two guys and frisked. And it was like, okay, it was, it was probably Jimmy Savile's idea of a bit of fun, but actually looking back on it now, and, and that's the thing of the process of writing the book. It was actually looking back at all this stuff through the lens of what, what came out after his death. And actually what I learned about him while he was alive, that he was setting the rules for the interview. He was setting the terms of engagement. I was on his turf. He was in charge. And these two guys went away. One of them was a former police officer. Another one was his mem member of one of his teams. He had these teams at all these different places he lived around the country. And then I was taken up to his flat and his flat was like this sort of weird museum of his life. You know, there was pictures of him with the Beatles. There were awards everywhere and like, he sort of invited me in and said, take a look around. And he went into the, he went into the kitchen and said, you know, what, what haven't I got in my kitchen? And I knew that. And he, he says, you know, I, I don't have, a, he didn't have a cooker. He didn't have a stove or anything. And he said, well, I don't have that because I don't want brain damage. I don't want a woman in my life. I don't want to be given brain damage by anybody thinking they've, they've sort of like, they've got me. And he invited me to look around and then, you know, there was just this museum to himself, you know, and then he came through and, you know, he'd made a cup of tea or something like that. And in his fridge, there was nothing apart from this sort of crate of milk cartons that was like gaffer taped together. And then we sat down and said, where do you want to start? And I said, well, let's start at the beginning. Tell me about your childhood. And he said, I didn't have a childhood. And then we went from there. And then it was six years. I mean, that interview was meant to be an hour, an hour and a half. It lasted, God, at least six or seven hours. It went into the night. Um, I think because I knew so much about him and then, and then further interviews came off the back of that because there was a lot of interest in that interview and other magazines commissioned me. And then I just kept on going. Do you think he was at ease because you had so much knowledge about him, like some sort of fanboy where he kind of thought, okay, he, like you were there not supporting him, but it was easier for him because you knew a lot about him also. I think, I don't think he thought I was a fanboy because I asked him at every interview, I asked him about the rumours, you know, why when you are this figure on the one hand, you know, this charity fundraiser, this sort of knight of the realm, this knight of the Vatican, why why do these rumours persist about you? What is it? You know, what, why why do people say that you're into kids, you're into dead bodies and all this sort of stuff? So I asked, I pressed him on that at every time I interviewed him. And, and the more I got out of him, the more I was able to press him. But so I don't think he was a fanboy because I said to him at the outset, look, I really didn't like you as a kid. I really didn't like you as a kid. And um, he said a lot of kids didn't. 
you're like a lot of other kids, which obviously, you know, feels quite prophetic now. But um, so I don't think it was ever a fanboy thing, but obviously the relationship when you're interviewing, I mean, that interview was a single day, but the, the next one was like two or three days. And after that, I'd, you know, he, he, and sometimes he'd say, you know, he'd want an interview and he'd sort of like call me up and say, you can come and stay at my house and we'll do more. You know, when, when, when it wasn't for a magazine and I, you know, I was trying to write this book, even though he was very resistant to the idea of me writing a book, because he said that somebody had tried to write a book in the early 70s, a reporter, and he basically rushed out his own autobiography because he wanted control. And that was the other really big theme in his life was control. He wanted to control. He controlled his own myth. He controlled his own image. He controlled what people said about him. And then he shut them down if if they went too far. And, you know, he he... He liked that control. I think he thought that, I think he was flattered at that stage because he was a bit of a relic. You know, he was in his late seventies. He was insignificant as a, he wasn't really a big frontline celebrity. He was like a bit of a dinosaur. And here was this guy from a cool men's magazine from London coming up and interviewing him and giving him 10 pages. It was 10 pages of utter weirdness, you know, about some of the stuff I mentioned, the connections with the Royals, Thatcher, all this sort of stuff. And that's why it got picked up because... I suppose people had forgotten about him or didn't know this stuff. See, when he says he can't remember his childhood, did they ever give any snippets of what happened about his childhood or did they just try and block something out? Was that well, he hated to... Because they say that a lot of people who get abused become abusers themselves. Was it a possibility he was abused? I think it's a possibility. I don't have evidence of that, but I've certainly considered it and I don't think it is beyond the realms of possibility by any stretch of the imagination. He, had a, a, he was fixated with his mother he was the youngest of seven. He was fixated with his mother. And then, you know, I think after his father died, he really almost tried to claim his mother as his own. And he used to sort of, you know, he bought her houses. He was like, visited her all the time. He went on holiday with her. He was seen at public events with her, called her the Duchess. But when I asked about his father, he tried and shut it down. And I had to really sort of research his father to try and piece together the, pe- you know, to, to, to find the pieces there. But he never really spoke about his father. He was very resistant, even to the point where I say, well, when, you know, when did he die? How the fuck should I know? 1864. You know, stuff like that, which, you know, to your point, it suggests that he's blocking something out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I just, I just don't know. I don't, I don't have that information. I think it's a possibility. What was it like after your first interview with him? Were you tired, drained, or was adrenaline high? I, yeah, I think the, the adrenaline was quite high. I mean, the photographer who came up there to take the pictures for the magazine sort of got, he'd been sitting sort of cross legged on the floor of Savile's front room listening to this, you know, it, this this conversation, which had roamed all over the place. I mean, he got up at the end and clapped. He said, That was fucking amazing. You know, that was just blown my mind. And I was quite buzzing off it, you know, because I thought, you know, I've, I've got a lot of mad stuff here. That, but, you know, I didn't feel like I, you know, got to the heart of who he was. It just left me with more questions in a way. And I suppose that was quite exciting. I mean, he he touched on things like, you know, the royal family. But, I, you know, I knew that the, those contacts and his influence there existed. And I tried to press him on that. And he was always talking about, well, there's a code of a murder. You know, as in like, I'm not going to say, yeah, I'm not going to say anything. And he always liked to sort of refer to himself as this sort of mafia don. And I think part of that you know, dates back to his times running dance halls, you know, the precursors and nightclubs in places like Manchester and Leeds when things, you know, could get quite on top and, you know, you had to you had to stand your ground. And um, I think he had to have some quite hard people around him, whether he was hard or not. Um, you know, I spoke to a few sort of quite known, well-known figures in the Manchester sort of underworld, if you like, who scoffed at the idea that Jimmy Savile himself was hard, but he, you know, he, he was surrounded by people who could certainly handle themselves. 1958, was that the first time there was accusations made against him? Difficult to know. I mean, I know that from 1965, I mean, there are accusations all the time. All the time. I mean, to actually find the first is almost impossible because there was so much sort of hearsay. And when you speak to people who were who went to his dance halls in Leeds, let's say, in the late 50s, or Manchester in the early 50s, late 60s, you know, early 60s, late 50s, you know, you say that, yeah, he was well known for like, you know, he was well known for his penchant for for younger girls. It was a sort of like nudge, nudge, wink, wink thing. That was the thing it was said. And I don't know whether that's a, a, a sort of cultural thing of the times that it was sort of almost like, 
more accepted then, even though it was it was still illegal. Um, you know, certainly as you went through the sixties, you know, you had like huge bands like the Beatles and the Stones and, you know, screaming teenagers and whatever else. And, you know, it's known that that bands slept with at times underage groupies and stuff like that. Whether they knew they were underage or not is another matter. But the first time that the be- the first time that the Met police, the first evidence that the Met had anything on him was in nineteen sixty four when he went into his name was was gathered in intelligence and went into the paedophile, not the register, but like files within Scotland Yard because he was fre- frequenting a house in Battersea uh, where a lot of runaway girls went, including girls from Duncroft School, which is comes back into the story a lot in the late, in the in the seventies. It's, it's mad how he, he he escaped. Like I say, nearly fifty years of accusations against them over fifty years. Yeah, and it's um, it's just. Like I say, it's fascinating how someone becomes a disc jockey, leads to then rubbing shoulders with some of the most powerful names in the world. When did they start kind of moving up the ladder? And yeah. how does someone go with like that? Like, obviously, he doesn't talk about his youth, but is he more is he connected to any other sort of power or other families? Then this has kind of been covered, or he's, he just came from nowhere and manipulated his way to the top. I think he I think the latter, to be honest with you. I mean he started out in Leeds. He was he was this disc jockey who who pioneered the use of playing records. I mean, at that time nightclubs had live bands playing in them. And you know, you'd have a little break between the live bands and maybe a guy might play a couple of records on a single turntable. And Jimmy Savile sort of started the idea of two turntables and then suddenly people were dancing to records more than live bands. And that became huge in the Mecca organization, which ran, you know, over a hundred dance halls, big dance halls in all the major cities in Britain. And he was this rising star in Mecca. Then he was taken on by Radio Luxembourg, given a job as a DJ there on the basis of the popularity he had in nightclubs or, or dance halls. And then he had a very big hit show on Radio Luxembourg, just as sort of rock and roll was was taking off and, and youth culture was exploding across Britain, you know, imported from America initially with you know, Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis and Little Richard and people like that. And then obviously with the the onset of the Beatles and the British bands. So, and then from from Radio Luxembourg, his success there brought him to the attention of the BBC. He always wanted to be in the BBC. His mother always said to him, oh, you know, he just sort of almost mocked him for the fact he was on this little known Radio Luxembourg station. She almost felt like if he got to the BBC, he'd arrived. And how much of that was like wanting to please his mum how much of that he recognised that the BBC was the establishment and if he could get into the BBC. So he got into the BBC. He was, you know, he was the first presenter on Top of the Pops in 1964. And then his his fame sort of moved on to another level. Then he was really national. I mean, he was big from, you know, big in terms of, you know, the Radio Luxembourg show had a big, had a big audience. But then when he went to the BBC and started with Top of the Pots, became this sort of instant hit. He became a, a, a national figure. And then he was taken on by uh, Radio One. And then, you know, things like, I think he, I think he was from a family that was, that was into charitable work. Certainly his mother was into charity. And from what I've researched on his father, his father was, you know, they were charitable with a Catholic family in Leeds, didn't have much, very working class church going, well, certainly his mother was. But then this uh, I'm Back in Britain campaign came out in the mid-60s and he became part of that. I think he realised what that would do for him. He just moved him onto another level. So things like the BBC, the I'm Back in Britain, what charity work and what what very uh, high-profile charity work could do for his profile. So then he started to sort of move into different circles. Yeah, because usually we talk about the secret handshake society, Mason and stuff like that to then get to the levels and mingle with the elite and get those bigger jobs but it's fascinating how he's came from nothing yeah. and worked his way around that especially with his looks his looks alone is fucking not as if it's an appearing someone fit and healthy he just looks dirty so it just passes me how he get past all the kind of was people vetted back then in the 60s and 70s well certainly they didn't want him I mean it's a really good point because like he was speaking in a Yorkshire accent you know like everybody on the BBC had this perfect cut glass accent and it was all sort of like, you know, pre- you know, very sort of posh accents on the BBC. Here's this guy from Leeds, 
you know, from the working class streets of Leeds with this mad hair, you know, at that, that times it was like half black, half white, wearing mad clothes, got loads of jewelry, all this sort of stuff. So the BBC were really not sure about him. They didn't, they didn't really want him for top of the pops. They wanted somebody else, but like there were people within the BBC who realized his popularity with the kids. You know, he had this sort of Midas touch with these, what he just described as record dances, but quickly became, you know, what people did it, what people expected from going out dancing. You know, they weren't just like dancing to shit bands playing covers of, you know, big bands or house bands, you know, house bands playing sort of rubbish covers. They were dancing to the records that were coming out that were topping the charts that were, that were on things like Top of the Pops or, or the, you know, Radio One when it started or Radio Luxembourg. And he, he sort of broke down that barrier. He was, I think he felt like an outsider, but he quickly, his, his popularity and his rating success meant that he got more and more power because he, he was a communicator. He was a very good communicator through the medium of music initially, through the, through the medium of his, his sort of whole look. You know, he knew how to shock people. He knew the impact, the effect it had on people. When he first played a record dance, which was above a, a shop or something in Leeds, he talked about the power. You know, he knew that then he had a power over people who were dancing to what he was playing. He was in charge of them. He talked about this power. So I think that that almost like that first experience of knowing that he could hold a room by playing records stayed with him. And that idea of having control over people. And then that grew as he went to the BBC and his career sort of like progressed. He knew how to orchestrate kind of things and keep like the puppet master. Yeah. He kind of how he could get people in his hands with, and um, obviously with the popularity as well, like we spoke earlier, people gravitate towards fame. And at the top of the pop was just watched by millions back then. What are you talking, 15, 20 million people back then? I mean, at least I would have thought, yeah. I mean, I don't know what the figures were, but certainly it was like, you know, there were, I don't know how many stations there were, maybe only two, three, two, 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 yeah. three, two or three TV stations. So like everybody was, you know, it was that, everybody congregated on the sofa to watch it at that time. And he was the first person and he was on every few weeks. You know, there was a rotor of people and he was on it from the beginning right the way through to the end, you know, and it was, yeah. it was, it was big. You watched those interviews back then with Gary Glitter and Rolf Harris and the way they are with young girls. It just, back then it's accepted, like we say, that it's accepted. It was normal then to hands around young girls and nobody batted an eyelid. I had the women on who was Rolf Harris's makeup artist. And he used to grope her, grab her boobs, grab her ass, and other people were just standing behind her laughing. Yeah. They're just kind of, obli not oblivious to it, they knew it was happening, but they didn't say anything because these were, guys were in such power, they manipulated to because they, they got sacked, this and that. Obviously the moral thing to do is fuck your job and do the right thing, but back then, like we say, the, the status and the fame was a different ball game. They did have power. See, when he was doing, like, the interviews, Top of the Pops and the Status Rise, when did they become, in, because I think you speak about it in the book with the mayor, was it Scarborough? Yeah, Peter Giaconelli. I mean, he he bought a house for his mum in Scarborough in the early 70s uh, and then spent a lot of time there. And then after she died, that became one of his bases. Um, so he sort of got to know Giaconelli, who was a big figure on the seafront at Scarborough. You know, the, he, he ran a big ice cream um, shop, you know, had a big ice cream business, and then he sort of became this bigger and bigger figure in Scarborough and became the mayor. So yeah, Jack and Ellie and him were were tight, definitely. And um, you know, Savile went to Scarborough a lot to see his mum when she was alive. She died in seventy three, I think it was. And then after she died, you know that that room in her in the flat in Scarborough was kept as a sort of shrine to her, exactly as she left it. Um, and he. He stayed there. And the thing about Savile is he always moved around. He lived this sort of totally itinerant lifestyle, even from a very, uh, very early days. You know, he had a base in Leeds. And in, in the old days, you know, it was an absolute tip. And he had a place in Manchester called, you know, at one time called the Black Pad, which, you know, was all painted black. And he lived there with a guy called Ray Terror, who was jailed for, um, well, twice actually, jailed. Uh, you know, for, for abusing minors. Um, and he was sort of one of Savile's protégés and they had this place called the Black Pad, which was totally black. And he had sort of various places, you know, he had a motor home, he had a place in London, he had a place in Scotland, latterly at Glencoe. 
And he just moved around all the time. And I think that the fact that he was constantly on the move meant it was very difficult to, one, know where he was at any one point, two, sort of really get a sense of what he was doing because he kept... He had these these groups of people called teams that sort of enabled him. They might be like a disc jockey or, you know, somebody worked in one of his clubs or, or dance halls. It could be a cleaner. It could be somebody who drove him, you know, did a bit of driving for him and all this sort of stuff. Or, or local police officers, you know, which he had in Leeds and he had in Manchester and other, and other places as well. Um, and he kept all those circles, all those teams very separate. So it was very difficult to know what he was doing. And I think that that, that that sort of willingness or that instinct to constantly move was one of the things that probably meant that he evaded capture. The guy Ray, is that the guy you talk about? Is that Mini Me? But he's the same. Yeah, the Mini Me of yeah. Thomas Avos. That's yeah. what he's in the book. Yeah. I've seen yeah. that, Ray. Yeah. So Ray was his best friend, like you say, his kind of prodigy, and he was charged. What year was this when he was charged? Well, he was charged, um, and I I need to look up the date, but it was probably my guess would be. Late 80s, and again, I, I I need to look up the date, but he was charged, you know, well before Savile got, you know, Savile died or any of this came out. And Savile basically cut him off because I think it was like getting too close. And they had definitely offended together in Manchester. There are sort of reports on it that people have come forward to say that, you know, Terrett worked in a club with him. He I completely idolized Savile. Whether Savile would describe Ray Terrett as his best friend, I don't think he'd describe anybody as his best friend. He always said that he didn't really have friends. He always spoke about his brothers and sisters, never been particularly close to them either. And his nieces and nephews, you know, he was, you know, to me at least, he was very sort of dismissive about his relationships with them. So, but anyway, Terry idolized um, Savile, you know, dressed like him, spoke like him, was schooled in how to sort of play records and hold a dance floor and all that sort of stuff and live with him and drove him around and all this sort of stuff. But he was you know, in later life, but well before Savile died or well before any of this came out, he he, he did um, jail time for uh, an offence, you know, sexual offence with an underage girl and then um, was sort of again captured in the whole sort of Operation U-Tree, U-tree and, and charged again and went to prison again. I mean, like his, the scale of his offending really came out. Yeah, it's mad to think his best friend was Charles Denise, his prodigy, his mini-me. Driving about, doing what they wanted. Well, his his brother was lost his job. He, he was work. His, his older brother Johnny was working at um, a uh, a mental hospital in Wandsworth, and he lost his job for uh, sexually molesting a patient. You know, so and I think that again that when when things like that started to get a bit close, you know, when 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 the truth started to get too close to Savile or the people around him that might have been offending with him or whatever, or that might, you know, lift the the, the lid, if you like, or, or make people ask uncomfortable questions, Savile just pushed them away. Do you think they were the ones that then threw under the bus, though, the ones close to him, they needed someone so he would give up the people who were close to him, who were doing it with him, while he gets a free reign? I, I don't know about that. I don't know about whether there was... There was, you know, they were sort of sacrificial lambs. I think that I don't think Terrett was sort of mixing with Savile at that time. I think he was just a, a serial sex offender, and he was caught. And you know, and this a girl who he abused came forward, and he was charged and went to prison for it. Um, Johnny Savile was working, you know, as I said, in a in a in a hospital in Wandsworth in London, not near where Savile was living. Um, I think they were certainly in contact, but who knows? I mean, again, like, you know, the fact that there's two offenders in the same family, um, you know, two sex offenders in the same family, again, it sort of makes you think about the question you asked earlier, you know, where does this sort of behavior come from? Yeah. What, what, what causes it? It's just trying to get to the root of how deep does this thing go? And it goes pretty deep. Obviously we'll touch on his connections, but. It just seems so deep and massive, a mass cover up. And what was it he had? Did they have some sort of spell over people? Did they have dirt on people? Like you see the kind of Epstein and Prince Andrew walking through the park. Why would that prince go near a known paedophile, a known sex case? Like it's, 
It's mind boggling. Are these people just think they're better than everyone else that no one sees through their bullshit? It's like there's just so many different questions to I think, try and get answered with these people. I think he I think he preyed on I think like a lot of paedophiles, he had this sort of inbuilt antenna for um vulnerable young people. He had an inbuilt antenna for vulnerability. And he had different ways, I think, of being able to assess the vulnerability of somebody in the very early stages of any exchange with them. And that would almost be like a sort of a green light system for him that was sort of hardwired and honed over a very long period of time. So I think that he preyed on a lot of vulnerable people, whether they were in hospitals, whether they were children, whether they were, you know, you know, even the, the sort of, even the sort of things he did, like even in his in his autobiography, he talked about episodes that, you know, like being on the seafront at Scarborough and seeing a cracking young girl, you know, out for a drive with her parents and like pulling alongside and saying, can I give, saying to the parents, can I give your cracking young daughter a lift in, or a drive around in my Rolls Royce and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, and in the book he writes about, you know, we had a fantastic time in my garage and all this sort of stuff. And, it, and then afterwards I returned her to her parents and everything was wonderful and all this sort of stuff. And obviously when this all came out, then he started to be able to triangulate these sort of stories that he'd spun very openly in his book. And I think this is the thing that he did all the time is he, he almost put it out there for everybody to see, you know, like you said that like, it's so it almost seems obvious now he couldn't look more creepy in what he wrote in his newspaper columns, he had a massive column for the Sunday people, in what he wrote in his autobiography, what he wrote elsewhere, what he said, what he talked about in chat shows or whatever he was on, like, oh, yeah, me and the cracking young girls, and, you know, surrounded by them. It's almost like he put it out there. It's like he was so brazen with it. It's almost like, and his defense on that was, well, of course I'm not doing this because, like, do you think I'd put it all out there? But it was really, it was a really clever calculation on his part that he he was he was almost able to sort of sail as close to the flame as he possibly could because he knew that fame and this whole this whole sort of power of celebrity that was getting more and more powerful would protect him and then eventually as he as he started to do more charitable works and those charitable works he started to be a fundraiser and that that brought him into contact with other people and then suddenly he was being photographed with prime ministers or you know or you know doing stuff with the royals or whatever it might be that protected him it gave him this sort of it gave him an outer shield i mean when he was given his knighthood in 2000 and when was it i think it was, it was either it was beginning of the 90s he was given his knighthood and he was interviewed by lynn barber who's a brilliant one of the great sort of newspaper interviews interviewers and his response to the knighthood was i'm off the hook not like what an amazing honor you know, I'm I'm so humbled by the fact I've been given a knighthood, but I'm off the hook, and that's that's how he felt about it. And I think that he he knew that he'd done all this stuff, but the 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 contacts, the connections, the influence, the circles he moved in was a was a a, a very powerful insurance policy. He felt he was right. Yeah. So in plain sight, is that some sort of weird kick that he's talking about his actual crimes? But getting turned on by it, or like you says there, is he saying that to maybe try and deflect, or somebody wouldn't be as brazen to admit that? Or again, is that the insurance policy to then cover his own tracks to then give him some so, sort of out if he ever does get questioned on it? I think it's a combination of all three. I think it's absolutely all three. I think he definitely got a kick out of it by, you know, I mean, the fact that he used to offend, you know, when he was a hospital porter, that he'd go and just sort of this sort of quick smash and grab sort of style of, you know, groping or offense, you know, like really disgusting behavior with a sort of a patient in a bed and then just move away again. The ability to be able to do that, I think was the sort of thrill for him and the ability to sort of like offend pretty much anywhere at any time because of who he was. I think that the, you know, it's fascinating because every time I asked him about these rumors, he'd start from a position of guilt and then sort of work backwards and sort of explain, well, well, of course, you know, people say I'm a paedophile and then sort of like, you know, sort of work backwards. Not like starting from, no, of course it's not true. You know, do, do you really think if I was a paedophile, I would, you know, I would have, would have been caught by now, surely. I mean, it's just nonsense. But he always used to start from a position of guilt and work back. And the, 
you know, what was fascinating, I think, after, you know, after his death and after the sort of whole facade that he controlled and he built around himself crumbled and the truth came out and victims came forward in their droves, in their hundreds, and the accounts of what he'd done and how he'd done it, you know, came to light, you could actually start to see that some of the things he told me, some of the things he'd written, some of the episodes he'd sort of were his well-polished stories related to to people who'd actually been abused or raped or sexually assaulted and had lived with that in the years since. And I think that the reason people couldn't, part of the reason people didn't come forward is they didn't think they were going to be believed because he was this huge famous figure on TV and they were, what, some 14-year-old girl from Burnley or Bournemouth or Blackburn or whatever. What about the story when he was in the car with his the 15-year-old girl? The police pulled him up, but it was like 11.45 and he was waiting for her to turn 16. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, he talks about that. You know, he just said like, yeah, I'm just waiting for 15 minutes until I can have my way with her when, when it's legal. And he, you know... Even with me, like, you know, when we when I was interviewing him, we might be walking out, you know, whether it's Scarborough's seafront or out in Leeds or, you know, wherever it was, he'd make these comments, you know, about sort of girls. God, I hope she's legal and all this sort of stuff. And it was almost like, it's like this Tourette's of the soul. He was like, he couldn't help it. It was like coughing it up. And it was almost like by the end, I think as his his powers really started to fade and his health was really fading. And I think his potentially his his mind was going as well. I think he was struggling to keep it all in because he knew it was, he knew it was going to come out. I mean, the epitaph on his gravestone was it was good while it lasted. I mean, you know, it's absolutely nuts though. Like, was his book not called God will fix that? Well, yeah, he, he did have a book. He, this is the mad thing. He became so big at the BBC he was basically identified as the sort of face of religious broadcasting at the BBC. I mean, he was a devout Catholic, or supposedly devout, a devout Catholic, although I don't think he ever, you know, took communion or did mass, you know, did, did, the, did the sort of, you know, went through with the sort of what he should be doing with his Catholic faith, the articles of his faith. But he, he presented a show called Speakeasy, which was like this sort of quasi-religious show, and it was part of the religious you know, strand at the BBC. He was seen, and he talked about himself as the sort of like, I am the sort of, I am the face of religion for for the BBC. So it's just, it's it's extraordinary. I mean, he, he, he I mean, how people didn't see it. And the, I think what, what's really interesting is that what came out, I mean, particularly at the BBC, you know, the, the, the Dame Janet Smith report, you know, identified very clearly that there was a culture of, you know, these people were so big, so powerful, so important to the BBC in terms of ratings that these complaints were just brushed under the carpet. And making too much money from them. He was making, yeah, he was making money for them. And he was making a lot of money for himself. And he, I think he, as I said, he very cleverly and correctly calculated that his fame, his celebrity, his growing circle of influence, and his connections, which you know, through the 70s and 80s and 90s, got even bigger um, through, you know, big public campaigns to, like, rebuild Stoke Mandeville Hospital. That was, like, a huge nationwide campaign that everybody got involved in. It was, like, sort of before children in need and things like that. It was, like, a national a national effort to rebuild this hospital. When did they get involved with the sort of charity work, the hospitals, and then going to prisons, and then... Broadmoor, like it wasn't just one thing. Like it's totally night and day from trying to help kids to then becoming best friends with serial killers. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it was all tactical of pretending to be the good guy where we can manipulate the vulnerable. Or was there a sense of any sort of goodness in this man, or was it everything pure, calculated for his own wicked gain? I think that, I think that he. I mean, in God will fix it. Just coming back to that, which was a book about a really bizarre book about his ideas on religion and faith. He talks about there being a ledger. He knows he's done lots of bad stuff. He's writing about this quite openly. I know I've done all this terrible stuff in my life, but if I do all this good stuff, if I do the charity, when I come to the pearly gates and St. Peter like looks at his ledger and says, are you coming in or not? 
I've got all this on one side, even though I know I've got all this awful stuff on the other. So he, that's how he looked at life. So I think that, you know, the, 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 the Leeds General Infirmary was the first big hospital he worked at, and that was part of the I'm Back in Britain campaign. And he basically thrust himself upon them and said, like, I'm going to work here. And I think, you know, he had a mate who worked there, and, and that's covered in the BBC drama. And um, he sort of, like, became a bit of an irritant, but, you know, he also probably raised some money and got some profile. And then I think, you know, through Top of the Pops and the fact that his pub, you know, his hospital work at Leeds was quite well publicised, he was he claims to have been contacted by inmates or patients at Broadmoor Hospital asking him to come down. He went down there, he met the the governor or whatever it was, and inveigled himself into that and to the extent we had his own keys. And then Stoke Mandeville, where he'd sort of had some some dealings. That was sort of falling down in 1979, and Thatcher came to power on a on a platform, and no more, you know, no spending. I'm not, I'm not going to, we're not going to put the money into this to fix, you know, the major spinal injuries unit in Britain. And she called, and Savile said, "Look, I'll I'll do this for you, and I I I will go to my grave uh, insisting that Thatcher guaranteed him a knighthood if he rebuilt." state mandeville and basically saved her from having to do it because it was a national disgrace and she campaigned for him to get a knighthood every single honors list from 1979 until she finally got it through when she was leaving 10 downing street in her final honors list and his response to that was i'm off the hook that's crazy right? that's her response to that what about peter Sutcliffe, the yorkshire ripper would he kill 13 women like how did they end up good friends with this Man, because I know, I think it was in your book where it talks about they had to take images of his teeth, like mould his teeth, because apparently there was teeth marks on these girls that could actually have been Jimmy Savile. Is that correct? Well, there were there were bite marks on some of the victims, and so he he met Sutcliffe. Um, I think the first time was. In a, on a prison visit to the Isle of Wight, I think it was. I think that's where he was sent first, Sutcliffe. And then when he was at Broadmoor, I mean, Savile was in and out of Broadmoor all the time, and he 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 met Sutcliffe a lot. And he always said, oh, Peter, he was as good as gold. And I says, well, he wasn't really as good as gold, was he? I mean, he, he, he killed quite... He, 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 not, 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 not really as good as gold, let's face it. You know, he was quite a bad man. And, like, he would talk about... Um, these people being sort of overtaken by impulses and they weren't bad. They were like, they were, they were, they were sort of at the mercy of these impulses that overtook them. So he would refuse to sort of say that, that Sutcliffe was a, was a bad man. Anyway, during the, you know, before Sutcliffe was caught or before anybody knew who Pete, Pete Sutcliffe was during the Ripper manhunt. I mean, a lot of men in Yorkshire and Manchester and all around there were, were called in. I mean, the, the police, interviewed hundreds and hundreds and called people in but one of the victims was found very close to his flat in round hay park and um savile was known there were police reports that he was known for sort of being in and around round hay i think not round hay where was it chapel town in leeds which was sort of area a lot of prostitutes were i think there were bite marks on this victim and he was he was called in and they did take mold of his teeth because he was probably like a lot of other people uh you know, he was he was interviewed by the police, but he whether he was a big a big sort of suspect or not, I don't know. But he certainly sort of somebody from the police said to me he was very excited. You know, when this body was found, you know, basically outside his house in Roundhay Park. Could that could they have been friends before Sutcliffe went to prison? Uh, and I like some sort of trophy, some sick, satanic kind of weird fetish. Of leave the body next to my house. Listen, I'm just I, I, I'm going off. I've yeah. got I've got no idea about that. I mean, I, uh, I I I would have thought it's pretty unlikely, but then again, you know, Jimmy Savile's story is is pretty unlikely. I certainly didn't have any evidence for that. Um, but he was. They did take it seriously enough to take a mould of his teeth, you know. Um, so, and they did have you know, intelligence on him that he was, you know, frequenting Chapel Town or the main red light area in Leeds. So there was there was police intelligence on him. He wasn't like somebody who was completely whiter than white. And there was police intelligence on him for a long, long time at various police forces. And that was because of this fact that he moved around all the time. 
how can he be friends with a serial killer? That man murdered 13 innocent women. Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, it, I'm laughing because it's fucking crazy. Like, this is a high-profile figure. One of the biggest celebrities in the UK, if not the biggest, is then friends with a man who's then killed innocent people. But then when he speaks about him, he says he's a good person, he's this and that, it's only impulses. Could he possibly be speaking about himself when he speaks about these people? Yeah, I think that's that's a really interesting point. And I think, you know, why Broadmoor? You know, why why Broadmoor? I mean, Stoke Mandeville, he was in the spinal injuries unit. There were people who were paralyzed and couldn't move. I mean, you know, you talk about vulnerable. You know, Broadmoor, I I feel that with Broadmoor, you know, the, the deeper he went there and the more he tried to find out and the more he looked and the more he spoke to people, and he ended up being basically the boss of Broadmoor. You know, Thatcher based, Thatcher's government put him in charge of a task force to 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 take over Broadmoor when Broadmoor and a lot of the special hospitals were in sort of disarray. He was he was put in charge of a task force. He was the governor, and he fell out with because it was run by uh, the prison officers' union. It wasn't like nurses; they weren't psychiatric nurses. There were there were psychiatric nurses there, but there were, the prison officers ran the ran the place. And he was Savile was hugely unpopular with them because he just sort of got rid of loads of them and. He just sort of cracked down on them. But I do think, I do think, you know, what you said is, is a very high possibility in the sense that he wanted to understand how people were diagnosed, how people were treated, what sort of tells there were, if you like, for that sort of behavior, because there were plenty of, you know, serial sex offenders inside Broadmoor that people, that, that he could get an understanding of perhaps how their minds were similar to his worked how they were treated how they were identified you know is this another layer of this sort of insurance policy to actually be able to you know understand how these people were caught or what mistakes they made or or even you know just to to gravitate you know i think you know sex offenders seem to gravitate towards each other doesn't it and i think that there was probably that gravitational pull for him as well with some of those people. How much he was friends with Peter Sutcliffe, I don't know. I think Peter Sutcliffe was like a bit of a trophy association, a bit like a lot of these other people. You know, it made him look even more interesting that on the one hand, he was, you know, Prince Charles's, you know, inner circle advisor. And on the other hand, he's like, you know, he's rubbing shoulders with Peter Sutcliffe in, in Broadmoor, you know, maybe even in the same week. Was he educating himself? with these psychopaths to then learn and not make the same mistakes as them or is it a possibility he got the kicks out of them telling their stories of the hideous things that they've done probably I, both i think probably both yeah i think i think there was definitely a sense that he wanted to understand how you know the sort of like pathology almost of a psychopath and i think he was a I think he was, you know, he ticked so many of the boxes for the sort of identification of a psychopath. I do think he was. Um, and I think that he was interested in other people probably like him. And I think that the more he could understand about, you know, not only how they were treated, but how they were caught and what sort of impulses led led to their capture, led to them, you know, being jailed or hospitalized or, or given sort of life sentences then the more he could probably avoid that how does a presenter get the keys to broadmoor like w w what was the rumors of the, the t was there any one ever come forward the thing about broadmoor i always speak about this woman as well barbara barbara here right um she wrote the book the hospital she exposed the hospital um where was this place aston hall right and uh, what the evil doctors used to do, they used to have a checklist, get the kids from the broken home, addict, addict parents, uh, these kids are kind of addicts themselves, very young, so they could sign them off as crazy. So when the kids were running away and exposing it, they would just take them straight back because they were signed off as, as nutcases. So was that part of his plan as well, was to get the keys for Broadmoor so they could manipulate people, abuse people, or was it not as... I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think he, it wasn't just Broadmoor, you know, he was involved with, um, was it Rampton, the other special hospital? Um, you know, he took kids, he took like parties out of special hospitals for, you know, visits to the seaside and stuff like that. He had the power to be able to say, okay, I'm going to take a busload of, you know, uh, 
you know, not convicted, but like yeah, certified, yeah. certified, dangerous, mentally ill people. And I will take them to the seaside for a trip to see Peter Giaconelli, um and my mum at Scarborough. And he had that ability to, you know, turn up when he wanted, park his motorhome in the grounds, had the keys, could walk in and out pretty much onto any wing that he wanted. And there were reports of him like, you know, loitering around the, the women's wing and like a bath time and stuff like that. And just sort of like standing there and looking and leering and, and whatever else. I mean, he just had the run of the place. I mean, he had the run of Leeds General Infirmary, he had the run of Stoke Mandeville, he had the run of Broadmoor. You know, he had, he had, and there were hot, these weren't the only hospitals because of his profile and, you know, this sort of charity do gooder. And that's what he was seen as at that point. Pretty much any hospital he could turn up to and just get the free runoff. And it was like that sort of, again, that sort of smash and grab offending that, that happened there. You know, people in beds can't move, sick, ill, or paralyzed, or handcuffed, or on, you know, solitary confinement or lockdown, whatever it might be. I mean, whether he had, you know, keys to people's cells or not, I don't know that. But it's it seems beyond belief that somebody like that, and, you know, nurses saw this stuff and doctors you know whether leading doctors did but nurses reported this stuff they said like you know he shouldn't be allowed near these people like he's a he's a menace he's a pest he's like he's not good i don't like him make make them feel really uncomfortable but like you know similarly like the bbc with the these complaints were brushed away because you know what he's bringing us profile he's fundraising for us he's making money and all the while He's weighing up that ledger in his mind. You know, I'm doing all this terrible stuff, but I'm do-gooding at the same time. So I'm, I'm, you know, the Catholic guilt thing is sort of like being balanced out. Yeah, but do you think as well, because a lot of unwell people mentally ill, they couldn't report it because no one would have believed them. Yeah, who's going to believe them? Who's going to believe them? I mean, of all the vulnerable people, who's going to believe a convicted rapist or, you know, I mean, you might argue those people, like they, they've sort of forfeited their... They're right, but like, you know, they're so they're the last in the line of people that's going to be believed by anybody, aren't they? How did they get in power with the royal family? Like, what was his in? Was it an uncle? I believe was it? It was Mountbatten because he was he was involved with the um, the he was involved with the commandos and down uh, and he got involved with them and he sort of did some fundraising. And I think again, it's all this sort of publicity he did the assault course the commando training assault course all this down at limpston i think in in devon and um mount batten who was really the power behind the throne was you know the prince charles's favorite uncle very much very powerful figure within the royal family was um i think the sort of honorary general or the you know whatever the colonel of the the commandos they got into contact as savile says it or he came into contact with mount batten through that as Savile described it, you know, he liked my can-do attitude. It was an attraction of opposites, you know, like this ultimate blue-blooded, you know, royal lineage, posh, you know, whatever, Mountbatten, and then this sort of working-class kid, not kid, grown man from Leeds, you know, in mad clothes. So that 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 was the first um, relationship. And then I think it sort of developed through the Duke of Edinburgh a little bit. And then I think, you know, Mountbatten and Charles had a very tight relationship. I think Charles sort of really idolized his uncle. And I think his uncle thought that Charles needed somebody who would give him no nonsense advice, would give him a touch of the common people. And I think that's how he, you know, Savile came into that orbit. And he became, you know, initially he was like, because of all the work he was doing in hospitals, it was almost like, you know, Prince of Wales, first in line to the throne. What does he actually do? He had to have interest in certain places. And I think he was part of this inner circle of sort of unofficial advisors. I think that's where all the question marks came in. I don't think it it would have been as big if he wasn't in with the royals, with Prince Charles and in their cars and in the palace. And it just makes it more, that gives more scope for the conspiracy theories to then talk about as they trafficking kids, are they drinking blood, are they eating flesh, are they sacrificing? It can make the wine go, and there's never any proof of that, but it does make people question how is a guy who's brought up in Leeds, disc jockey, TV presenter, to be then telling 
royalties, what to do, and giving them information. Like it doesn't make sense. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I don't buy all the the conspiracies about drinking blood and trafficking kids and stuff like that. I think they were, I think they were just hoodwinked like a lot of other people. I think that he would got an OBE, I think, in 1971 for his charitable works. He was starting to become this big, as well as being a sort of pop star and a celebrity. Uh, yeah, the charity thing has started, you know, he was a, he was a do-gooder. And, you know, those sorts of people do tend to get, and not to say that those sorts of people, not like Tari, all those sort of people with the same brush, but those sorts of people do tend to get honoured with things like OBEs and MBEs. So probably, you know, met somebody there, met whoever it was who gave him his OBE. And then he starts to become, come to their attention. He was seen as this sort of no-nonsense figure who told it as it was. And I think that that, you know, the fact that he'd broken down the barriers of the BBC, you know, not being the posh, perfectly spoken type that the BBC normally had on their shows or on their radio shows or TV shows. He'd broken down that barrier. And I think they probably saw him as somebody who could talk sense to a, you know, a young, not young, not that young at that time, but a prince who was sort of probably needing a bit of guidance. So you can understand maybe them falling from for his charade, his kind of presence, and listen, he was famous back then, but there comes a time where he must be getting vetted, and then the question marks must be getting put to them, like, listen, there's rumours that he's a paedophile, there's rumours he's friends with this one, he's got keys to morgues, he's keys to hospitals, people, he makes people feel uneasy, like, it's okay falling for it, understandable, somebody come in, very boyish, and just talking the good game, and 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 falling for his manipulation, that's that, that happens. But to stay friends with him for yeah. 20, 30 years, now that's a different ball game, especially with the rumours about him. So that makes people question something ain't right there. Well, I think it's a really good point because coming back to the, the knighthood um, that Thatcher, I insist that Thatcher promised him for rebuilding Stoke Mandeville and took her... 11 years to get considering how powerful she was you know across all of government she made that she was campaigning for it every honors list and the honors committee were coming back and going no because actually there are all these dark rumors about him we don't think he's right we're not comfortable with this you really can't be doing this it's not right there are background rumors about him that make us feel very uncomfortable about this so if that was known at government level at honors level it, it does seem very strange that he wasn't vetted. I mean, the fact that he was able to talk the truth to power, which I think was the way he described it. You know, he said that it was he 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 you know he didn't suck up to the prince or anything. I like told him as it was and bollocked him from time to time. But to the point where he was basically, and even Diana said this was like a go between between Charles and Diana when their marriage broke down. You know, he was the person who was sort of running messages back back and forward between the camps, you know, and she described, Diana described Charles as, you know, Charles's kind of mentor. Did they ever say he was in love? No, he never said he was in love. I think he was in love with his mother. Um, you know, not in that way, but I mean, he you know, was, 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 well, exactly. I say that as soon as I said it, it's like, yeah. he was, he was obsessed with his mother. There's no doubt about it, but. I don't know whether he was ever in love. I don't think he was. I don't, I don't, I mean, friendships, he didn't, you know, friendships were very odd for him. It was always on his terms and like whether, you know, a friendship like you or I might have with other people, I don't think he really experienced that. You know, he did have sort of slightly longer term relationships that came out after he died and he kept very, very secret um, because he always insisted in all the interviews I did with him, all the newspaper cuttings, everything he ever said, I'm never going to get married. I'm always going to be single. I don't want brain damage. You know, as I said at the beginning, I don't want the brain damage of relationships. You know, I don't want to be pinned down, never wanted kids, you know, hate kids. And that was again, you know, sort of like me, kids, I hate kids, you know, like, well, really? You know, like it's almost again, starting from that, that point of guilt. I don't know. I mean, I don't, See the woman. See the woman. Was it ever, was it bisexual or anything? Was it all his relationships with women or? Was the, the the relationships he had, you know, that, that came out after his death were with women, but certainly amongst his victims were were boys and young men. I mean, not not to the extent of how many women there were, 
I mean, again, just was he just sort of pushing it as far as he could go? Was he like, I mean, I do think that there was a, a real sort of high wire act that he really enjoyed. He was always on the high wire. He was so close. He was sailing so close to the wind at all times with so much at stake. And I think that was the thrill for him. And I think even talking to me, you know, like he knew that I wanted to write this book about him and he was, he was just really resistant to it. It's just like, no, not going to happen, never going to happen. You know, he told me the story about what had happened when a, a journalist had tried in the 70s and he said like, oh, just had, I just had to correct everything you got wrong. It's not going to happen, you know. And then he sort of started coming round to this idea. But he said like, you know, maybe what we could do is you can write it and then I can write stuff and tell you, you know, say everything that you've got wrong. I said, well, that's, you know, we're not going to be writing that book. I can tell you that for nothing. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I just... I don't think he was ever in love. No, not not in the way that you know we normal people might understand the meaning of the word. What about the necrophilia kind of stuff and the sleeping with the dead bodies? How true is that? Or is that just people just running away with their minds? Well, he had access to morgues, to morgues, yeah. And he really, you know, in his in his books, he talked about the great pleasure he got from wheeling the recently deceased to the morgues, you know, and there were reports within hospitals of people who were very uncomfortable about his interest and and desire to do that sort of work so um if, again it's certainly not part i mean who would who would have evidence of it unless they actually saw it but there were there were hospital orderlies and porters who who came forward and said you know he should not be allowed access he's not he's treating them with sort of disrespect you know, and, and he always talked about sort of the huge respect he had and how, what a privilege it was for him to be able to take somebody on their last journey from, you know, wheeling them down to the morgue and all this sort of stuff. But he was obsessed with death, absolutely obsessed with it. Could he have been a human trafficker for the rich and famous? Because obviously with the story of the young kids going through a London train station, yeah, I think I've seen the documentary, um, they were going through a London train station and people kind of, groom them and take them in houses, put them up, give them some money. But Jimmy Savile used to come to these houses, I believe. Yes, are, well, is that true? His his nephew, Guy Marsden, ran away from Leeds, his sister's son, ran away from Leeds as a teenager, I think he was about 16 years old, came down to London with a few other lads, arrived, arrived at Euston or King's Cross, I remember which. And they were, you know, they, these were just pickup joints for sort of runaways and, you know, waifs and strays and troubled kids. And they were taken and by this guy, weird guy who just was like found them, took them, took them to a house. And then he said after about three days, his uncle turns up. I mean, what are the chances of that? And I didn't bat an eyelid that he saw his nephew there and then took them to another house and was, according to Guy Marsden, who I interviewed for the book, said that, you know, they were down in London for whether it was a matter of weeks or a few months, but. Savile would take to parties in which, you know, the only people there were kids and men. So, yeah, I mean, it sounds very, very plausible. Yeah, because that's obviously what people gravitate was the most, that he was a, a kind of human trafficker, child trafficker to the kind of rich and famous, and that's why he was never exposed to the extent of getting charged and going to prison because of the information he had, same as like the Glenn Maxwell and kind of Epstein thing when they're rubbing shoulders with the rich and famous. And I always say this, but not everybody who goes to Epstein Island are paedophiles either. Some people may have got an invite for a party or whatever. But if you're going back three, four, five times, you've got to have question marks. Same as Jimmy Savile, even like Frank Bruno. But Frank Bruno's uh, mental health was gone. And I think Jimmy Savile being Jimmy Savile, he could manipulate the strongest minds, never mind someone who was struggling. But I think he was taking Frank to prisons and Broadmoor and getting falls with Sutcliffe, like... Well, that completely wrecked Bruno's mind. I mean, somebody who was, like, in a really bad place mm -hmm. at the time, and he had no idea that he was going to be introduced to Peter Sutcliffe. And bang, you know, the fact that there's somebody there taking a picture. I mean, Savile has set that up. And, like, that's power he's got over Bruno, then, isn't it? Not only is he completely messed with his mind, messed with his head when he's all over the place, but, like, now he's got a picture of him with Sutcliffe. I mean, I the the... The parties thing, you know, and like Guy Marsden, as I said, it was Savile's nephew. 
you know, talked at length about these parties and the sort of, you know, young girls that were there and then, you know, men going behind the door and like him and his mates were there to basically sort of try and keep these girls calm. And he talked about, you know, it being sort of quite a well-heeled clientele. It was all men. I mean, whether these people were rich and powerful or not, I don't know. I mean, I don't know about his trafficking. I think that as an offender, he was, Savile was, you know, I don't think he offended with other people. I mean, other than maybe Ray Terrett when he, you know, they got them, these girls back to the flat in Manchester. But I don't, I don't think, I think he was, it was all about him. He didn't, I don't think he, I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't have, I don't have any evidence of the trafficking other than, you know, the stuff about the parties. And, you know, I did, I did really try and investigate that, but I couldn't get anywhere with it. Do you think that's why he had keys to like morgues and hospitals and Broadmoor? Because he used to be a lone wolf and do it all himself where he knows he, he wouldn't get caught? Because if you're doing that against someone who's brain injuries, mental health, suicidal in prisons, they're never going to believe that Jimmy Savile's just opened your cell and came in and raped you or abused you. Yeah, I mean, you know, the I the 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 instances of it are just there's so many of them. You know, like a girl sitting and watching TV after an operation at Stoke Mandeville and he comes in and sort of, you know, sits down beside her and just sexually abuses her in the most disgusting, horrible way and she's just sort of left completely shocked. You know, like, not only that anybody's done that to her, but like somebody as famous as Jimmy Savile has just walked in. I mean, that would just, you know, how would you respond to that? And like kids did try and tell nurses or doctors, but they weren't believed. You know, they weren't believed. There's a culture of, of like, you know, either hushing it up because he was good news for the hospital or he's raising money for them, like Stoke Mandeville, you know. And once he'd rebuilt that spinal injuries unit, he was all powerful there. He described it as his hospital. It wasn't his hospital. He'd spearheaded a campaign to raise money for rebuilding the spinal injuries unit. And he had a a trust, I think, that that put money into it, but it wasn't his hospital. But yeah, I think you're right. I think that that he was. I do think he was much more of a lone wolf, and I don't have evidence of the trafficking. Although, you know, the the account of Guy Marsden, his nephew, about what happened, about the fact that Savile turned up at this house, so which suggests that Savile was sort of routinely going to this house because he had no way of knowing that his nephew was there. The fact that he didn't bat an eyelid when I mean you might think Christ my nephew's here this is going to get back to my family or like I'm going to get found out here but like he didn't bat an eyelid and then took them to another flat you know uh took them to these parties the fact he was going you know in 1964 his first time he was on the intelligence came through the Met Police and he you know into the Scotland Yard pedophile you know records or intelligence you know, he was going. He was frequenting a house where runaway girls were, you know, were were going to in Battersea. So, you know, there are pieces of evidence there. I wasn't able to to together. to put them together. Did you ever see the video when the young girl was in the hospital and she drew the picture and he says, "Oh, what did I ever do to you?" It was a picture of him. It was like the devil, and she says, "You know what you've done? Give you I the did, shit." I didn't see that. Oh. I mean, just to just give you the shivers. I mean, just like, you know, he, he routinely abused one girl who worked in the, you know, the chapel at Stoke Mandeville and had to sort of, you know, help with communion. But she had to go behind the sort of altar, or whatever it was, for a certain period. And he would wait there for her. And she dreaded it, you know, and he just found these opportunities and he did it. I mean, the book is called In Plain Sight because, for a very good reason, because he did do it in plain sight. And then he talked about it. He wrote about it in his columns he gave he left this breadcrumb trail of clues and the closer and closer people got i think the more thrill that he got from it and i think to some extent that was the same with me because he knew that i wasn't just writing a you know isn't jimmy savile great isn't he this great figure of fun and all the pieces i wrote there was a lot of darkness in there and i was and i wrote about the fact i didn't like him as a kid i wrote about the fact that i had these real misgivings about him i told him it i told him myself um, but I think, you know, he, you know, he enjoyed that, that challenge almost. He enjoyed sort of facing it down. 
with nearly 500 accusations, how many were actually close to ever getting him charged? Was there much evidence against him, even though, he's, like you say, it's like, it's hard to believe. One or two, maybe you can fight against it. But to have nearly 500, listen, a lot of accusations come out once they'd passed as well, but beforehand, was there anything to suggest that it was 100% what the rumours were about him? There were missed opportunities. The Surrey Police in 2008, Sussex Police investigated him. A woman came forward uh, who had been abused, I think as a teenager in the 70s, and came forward. And I think there was a, there was a, a after he appeared on Celebrity Big Brother, and it's a bit like when I was interviewing him, he sort of disappeared. He wasn't on TV. He wasn't in the news. He wasn't, you know, people used to see him out. Go, oh my God, it's Jimmy Savile. Look, he looks ancient, but a bit creepy and all this sort of stuff. But he wasn't frontline celebrity at that point. But he went on Celebrity Big Brother, and I think that triggered a lot of people because uh, a woman came forward, and I, again, I don't know categorically whether it was because of Celebrity Big Brother, but these things happen at the same time. She came forward and, and made, a re- or her husband did, a report to the police about what had happened to her in the 70s with Sussex Police, and they had an opportunity to properly investigate it, and they bungled it. And you know, the the, the four police officers basically said, in a matter of speaking, like, oh, do you really want to go through with this against somebody as famous as Jimmy Savile? And then, less than a year later, Surrey police uh, interviewed him under caution because at the same time, or around the same time that the woman in Sussex had come forward, um, women who had been at Duncroft School, which was like a bit of like a remand, posh sort of remand home for troubled girls, had come together on Friends Reunited and were talking about what had ha- what Jimmy Savile had done to them in the 70s. And sorry, police. Uh, there were allegations made, sorry, police, and they took it seriously enough to in, in, uh, interview him under caution in 2009. And that interview was pathetic, quite frankly. I mean, it was, he gave them the runaround about where it was. He dictated that it happened at, Stoke Mandeville and he had someone there sitting in with him you know they were like is it all right if we call you Jimmy and all this sort of stuff there was this sort of like you know deference to him and this this oh well you know like they just didn't push it they didn't they didn't push it and like and the way he deflected all the accusations against him was just classic Savile and again they bungled the opportunity to properly investigate him and that was that um group of women at Duncroft School was what sparked the um, Panorama investigation into him that was shelved um, very soon after he died. Because when he died, he had a state funeral. You know, it was like a three-day funeral. I went to it. He was in Leeds, it was in Scarborough, and then it was like it was like this it was like a state funeral. It was on TV. And Panorama were investigating him because the chief investigative reporter at Panorama was a guy called Myrian Jones. And he used to go to Duncroft in the 70s because his auntie was the headmistress there. So his parents used to take him to Duncroft to see his auntie. And Savile used to turn up and used to drive girls off the grounds in his car. And like his parents go, this isn't right. They were both teachers, I think. So they're like, this this isn't right. You shouldn't, you know, these girls are like here because they're troubled girls. And they're sort of basically under lock and key in a a sort of posh converted manor manor house. you, You can't be letting him drive these girls off the grounds he didn't know what's happening so marion he was a teenager then you know he never ever lost this and was throughout his career as a journalist probably you know, more so than me was like really looking into savile and then when he died he was able to sort of make contact he'd, he'd sort of infiltrated not infiltrated but he'd, he'd he'd found this friends reunited group who were talking about him and, and describing him as js this figure they weren't naming him but it was js And what he did to them, you know, like when he drove them off the grounds. Did they have much money? Yeah, he he was, He, I mean, he always claimed he had multi-millions, but when he died, I think it was about, his estate was about four million or something like that. I mean, he certainly had money. I mean, he never never paid for anything. He was was pretty tight. What was the worst accusations that were made against Jimmy Savile? I mean, I just, some of them are just so, so sickening. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, the necrophilia stuff is... It's pretty, pretty shocking, isn't it? Um, and I just think that the 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 nature and the 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 callous 
utter coldness, opportunistic nature of some of the rapes and, you know, violent, quick, opportunistic, um, you know, uh, cases of abuse, sexual abuse. Um, I think those were, I think, that, you know, the compound nature of those is they're all pretty shocking. I mean, it's difficult to pick out the worst. I mean, how do you, how do you say one's worse than the other? I think from a shocking point of view, the, the necrophiliac stuff, which again, how do you prove that unless you actually see it or you have photographic evidence? Um, but that's, that's pretty shocking, isn't it? Although, yeah. although, you know, those people are dead in fairness. It's, you know, they're not, they're not going to be, it is awful, of course, but like, it's not as bad as somebody's going to live with that, is it? You go spend years living with what he did to them. And I think that the, the fact that that, that, you know, a lot of people were, were definitely triggered by that celebrity big brother because he was, he was sort of nowhere. He was a forgotten man by that time. And it's interesting that the woman in Worthing came forward, the women in at Duncroft School or ex Duncroft School came forward. And there were other investigations over the years that, you know, the newspapers had him on a couple of occasions. I mean, the Sunday People had him, and he was a columnist for the Sunday People. The Sunday People were, were, was a campaigning, investigative newspaper. It wasn't like a throwaway tabloid. It was a, it was a, it was a great investigative newspaper in the sixties and seventies. They had him, and they they canned it. Did they have as much power as what people thought, or was it just a little ahead of the game to cover his tracks? Because people think he was so p- powerful, popular that he was never going to prison because, obviously, his connections, or was he quite shrewd in his moves? I think he was very shrewd in his moves. I think, as I said, he he correctly calculated that the combination of charity, fame, celebrity, influence, and connections was going to be enough to keep him, you know, to keep people away. And he's also very litigious. I mean, I interviewed him once around the time that the Oak de la Garenne you know, the children's home in Jersey, there was a huge case about abuse going on there and they were talking about finding dead bodies and all this sort of stuff. And he'd visited Oak, Oak de la Garenne and there was a photo in the newspapers of Jimmy Savile with all these kids at, at this this children's home in Jersey that was the centre of this en- enormous scandal. And I was interviewing him in Leeds and like, he said, hold on a minute, I've just got to make a phone call and all this. And he just, he was on the phone for about 25 minutes just looking at me like I'm looking at you now. Basically, and I don't know whether there was anybody on the other end of the line or not. There might well have been, but who knows? I have my doubts. And he was just talking about um, how he was going to sue the newspapers, what he was going to get out of them. You know, these dirty pigs, these tabloid scum who come after me. I've made thousands of them. I'm going to make thousands more. I want to see exactly what they're going to write to apologize. I'll bring them to their knees. You know, he and and then he put the phone down and he didn't he hadn't taken his eyes off my eyes for the whole of sort of 20 minutes while he was sort of outlining that. And whether that was sort of like an overt, don't get too close because this is what happens. He was certainly very quick to sue anybody that, that sort of well, said they, they were him, yeah. Did they ever break character? Did they ever lose his temper? Yeah, I mean, he def- definitely did towards the end at times. He, he, he always claimed he never, never had a drop to drink. But then he, when he had a... Uh, a uh, heart bypass so he had you know he was rushed into hospital for a heart bypass he started to drink a bit after that and occasionally sort of late at night you'd see this other side of him where he could get quite angry and quite dark and you know I remember that one of the last times I interviewed him out of nowhere he just started like getting really angry about Gary Glitter and what had happened to him it was around the time that Michael Barrymore was you know in the papers for all the stuff that had happened to him and he was talking about Barrymore and like how that these tabloid scum come after him and ruin his life and has you know Gary Glitter had done nothing wrong, nothing wrong. They just he just found you know just, all they did is he took his laptop to a you know repair shop and they found a, and in, in his words a few dirty images on his laptop. I said that's not that's not true. He'd been convicted in Vietnam. You know, he had a string of convictions by him, and I was like just went straight back at him. I said you can't say that. You cannot say that. And he was really angry about that. And at that point, and that was about, I don't know, just over, maybe just before a year before he died, I just thought, I need to get away from this. I need to like stop hearing all the same, all these stories, because he told the same stories over and over again. I need to sort of get away and I need to like start to speak to some other people. I need to like work in these big concentric circles. And I, and I started off 
interviewing people that I didn't think he would be in contact with because I, if I, if I interviewed people he was in contact with or in his circles, he would shut it down because he'd know I was then, you know, First again. getting close. And I, I, and a lot of those people, once he died, I was able to speak to them, including Ray Terrett. And that was a really, that was a really bizarre and troubling interview. See, that's the telltale signs there when he's sticking up for Gary Glitter. He was charged with having sex with kids and he was charged again when he came out of prison. He was caught with 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds like birds of a feather in it flocked together and the way he operated with Gary Glitter and Rolf Harris, they just looked in awe of each other that they knew what they were doing was wrong but no one could touch them. Yeah, I mean, I think I just, just as I said to you, you know, when he said that to me, I was like, really... He said things to me in the past that sort of like made it troubled me and like, you know, not, not as overt as that. Nothing like, I never knew, you know, I never knew the truth. You know, I had my doubts. I had my, I had my theories. I thought that, you know, God, if he hasn't been caught after all this time, you know, despite all the rumors I'd heard all my life about him pretty much since I was a kid. I said, if he, you know, if he, I was telling myself, if he hasn't been caught, then maybe something else. Maybe he was responsible for killing somebody. You know, because he always talked about beating, you know, his bouncers beating people up and, you know, troublemakers up and he, you know, in the dance halls in the 50s and 60s and ruling with a rod of iron and and having a policy of zero tolerance with troublemakers. Maybe, maybe he caused a death and I'd been living with that. Maybe that was his sort of secret. And I was sort of like playing with that theory for a while. But, you know, when, when he said that stuff about, you know, it was like, it just came out of nowhere. He said we were talking about something else. He just suddenly sort of like got really angry and like started saying this stuff about Barrymore and Gary Glitter and like, you know, I was just like, I just said, like, I can't sit here and like listen to that because it's like, as you say, he was a convicted paedophile and, you know, to hear him defend and, and brush off what he'd done by just like, oh yeah, you know, he'd, uh, he'd taken his laptop to the, to the repair shop and they'd found a few dirty images, a bit more than that, Jimmy. Did you ever question yourself after I'd been with him for so long that possibly the rumours might be false because of his manipulation tactics and who he was. Did you ever question that sometimes? You no, know sometimes if you're with each other and you spend enough time, you might go, nah, you try and look for other avenues like you say that might have been something else because he was never charged. And that what, and he can always say that, which is true, but did you ever question being with him for so long that possibly it might be false allegations or people out to get him or did you just think, nah, there's just something not right? I think, I think obviously I question myself because of that, because the fact he hadn't been charged, but I always knew there was something. I mean, the fact that, as I said, right at the outset, here was one of the most immediately recognizable public figures who had, who had just courted fame and publicity and attention at all times. And yet nobody knew who he was. He was like completely cut off. That was really interesting and i just like why i was, my question is to him why why do these rumors persist then given that you know as, as he was reeling off his achievements like i've raised 42 million pounds for charity i've rebuilt a hospital i've got a knighthood i've been knighted by the vatican i've been knighted by the queen i've been you know got an obe and all this sort of stuff and i said well why you know with given all this why do these rumors persist how the fuck should i know you know well, yeah and he call people pigs and you know you call them scum and all this sort of stuff they were looking to like ruin him and all this sort of stuff and i just you know you think like is there a grain of truth in that um but i always knew there was something were you ever hoping for a confession or was it too smart for that well you know what i i really struggled with what what the book was going to be for a long time i sort of for a long time it was going to be called apocalypse now then and uh what does that mean well i because his phrase was now then now then now then and it was like apocalypse now in the sense like like the the film i felt like i was sort of going up this river of his life and he was like the colonel kurtz at, you know in the film at the this mad figure at the end of it and there would be this big confrontation in which i would you know i would gather all my evidence and i would put it to him and see what he said and whether he would have confessed or not i don't know and that's you know after what he said to me about about Gary Glitter and Barrymore and all that sort of stuff. And obviously, you know, I'm not putting Barrymore in the same same camp Not as Gary Glitter. Yeah. But, you know, I, I just made the decision that I was going to go away and actually rather than just speak to him, I was going to speak to a lot more people. I had to like, I had to get away from him because I was troubled by him 
And I had to start sort of trying to piece the pieces together. So my plan was that I was going to work in these concentric circles and then move in, move in. And when I had what I, when I had everything and I started working back, you know, I started right back in the fifties and sixties. And it was hard to find people then because obviously it was a long time ago. And those people are much less likely to be in his circle. So I started from the beginning and I was working forwards and I probably got to about the, I don't know, the mid, mid to late sixties when he died. So, you know, the plan was always to like go away, do the research, find the people, do the digging, do the investigation, and then come back to him and present everything that I found. And I started to do that, but even before what he'd said, because I remember one of the last times I interviewed him, he was quite shocked because I'd, I'd gone and found all these people from the 50s, and I'd said, like, you know, he was like a cyclist and all this sort of stuff. And he was like a bit like, oh, shit, you know, how on earth did you find him, you know, sort of thing. And I think that might have been troubling for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's mad to think that you were there with him at that time. What was he gaining out at all with it going for so long? Because think, they never seemed to break character. They always seemed, they always, if, like we says earlier, it seems very calculated, knows what to say, when to say it. He never really let the mask slip enough for people to really see who he really was. But what was he gaining from it? I think he was gaining, you know, it was like me blowing on the embers of his fame. You know, he was finished. He was washed up. He was like a dinosaur. And I, you know, big magazine profiles in, you know, cool magazines, you know, and big newspaper pieces and stuff like that. It was almost like I'm still relevant. You know, that's why he probably did things like Celebrity Big Brother because he was sort of rattling around, you know, just with the memories of his fame and he was becoming increasingly irrelevant. So I think, one, there was the sort of um, vanity of, you know, publicity again, and, and that was like an oxygen to him. I think, two, he he enjoyed the chase or the fact that I was trying to chase who he was and I think that sort of was part of his whole psychological makeup for years and years and years, and that probably sort of reawakened that. Um, but even beyond the, um, even beyond the sort of magazine pieces, you know, there were times where he'd sort of phoned me up. I mean, I went on the QE2 with him. He phoned me up. I'd just split up from a, a girl I was seeing, and I was moving out of a flat, and he just phoned me up out of nowhere and said, you know, all right, Double D, what's going on? And I was like, well, I'm, I don't want to talk, to be honest. I'm not in a good place. I'm moving out of my flat, just split up with my girlfriend. Don't want to talk about it. And he said, well, look, get yourself down to Cadiz. I'm on the QE2. Come on the QE2 with me. And I just thought, okay, I'll go. You know, it's just going to be great color for the book. Whenever this book comes out, it's going to be an amazing piece of color. And I spent like four days on the QE2 with him. Um, which was really bizarre, and I couldn't wait to get off by the end of it, to be honest. But um, I think, I don't know, I mean, I think he, I think he was hoping probably that I was going to secure his epitaph in print, that I was going to write some piece about the amazing Jimmy Savile. And I think that I always thought that whatever the truth, he was an amazing he's almost like the story of post-war Britain in a way, you know, he was a Bevin boy minor during the war. He was there at the birth of rock and roll. He was there all these pivotal moments in history. He just keeps popping up this sort of clown, like sinister clown figure. He keeps popping up at these mad moments of history. And I just thought through his weird life and weird story, I could tell a story of post-war Britain in some ways. Um, and I think that he was quite seduced by the idea that I was going to, write this amazing book about him. Um, but I, I wasn't going to ever do that because I, I, and I was struggling with it because I didn't, I didn't think I got to the truth. How big was the BBC cover up? Uh, was it as big as people make out that it was a mass cover up or was there nothing to it where, what the, the, the yeah. panorama, mm -hmm. how big, because I always talk about the BBC cover up with Jimmy Savile, but yeah, the panorama thing was, was shocking to be honest with you. Was they, they had, they had amazing and very, firm evidence against uh that, that he was abusing but they also at the time and you know the the, the people involved with this will maintain that it wasn't the case and did maintain it wasn't the case but they'd had 
planned tributes to Jimmy Savalon at Christmas. So he died in October. They were already Panorama, Myrian and Liz McKean, his, 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 who's, who's very sadly dead now, but she was working with him on this investigation. They've spoken to a lot of these women and they had you know, really good evidence that he was abusing, but there was no appetite. There was no appetite to within the BBC, it seems, to do anything to sully the name of a guy who's just had a three-day, you know, quasi-state funeral. So it was terrible. I mean, I, I detail the, the, the process of that panorama investigation being shelved and it led to like Myron Jones and Liz McKean, the two brilliant journalists, leaving the BBC. Well, they're brilliant journalists. So actually, Myron came to me after it was shelved and said, I know you're writing this book. I'm going to tell you everything I've got. What about the, his connection with the police? He seemed to have a lot of power over some of the police. I don't know if that's maybe people who's in awe with him or it goes a lot deeper. Like how he seemed to have a, he seemed to call the shots with the police. Why? Well, I think that goes back to he developed close relationships with the police when he was running dance halls he knew that you know i think he sailed pretty close to the wind both with girls both with you know underage girls but also with um you know his nose zero tolerance tactics with troublemakers so he needed the police on the side from an early day from the early days and he cultivated them and i think there was a, a sense that some of them were sort of in awe of this big celebrity this big star and he'd have them around their, his flat for like, you know, the Friday morning club, uh, you know, was in Leeds, in his flat in Leeds. There were loads of police officers that came around routinely. And he'd talk about like every time he, he you know, he got at times got sort of letters from people who were like, and he was claiming he was trying to be blackmailed, but actually people were saying that you've abused me and I'm going to out you and all this sort of stuff. And he'd hand these letters to the police, talked about giving these letters to the police. So the police knew that there were people writing letters to him saying, um, you know, you abuse me and I'm going to out you for this, you know, and all this sort of stuff. And, but the, the, the instinct or the knee jerk was always, oh, well, you know, it can't be Jimmy. Was he a Mason? Was Jimmy Savile a Mason? I don't know. I don't know. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I never found any, I mean, not that it, it would be on display anywhere. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all, but I didn't have any evidence for it. Because with the King Charles stuff, was there not lots of gifts from him and like presents and from through the years? Yeah, there were presents and there were, you know, in the auction that took place, he basically, all his belongings were auctioned off after he died. And that was part of his will. He wanted that to happen. And there was a whole section on gifts from royals, from the royals. Who got his money? Um, there were a few friends that got, or a few friends, a few associates and members of the family that got a small amount. Um, and then most of it went on, um, you know, compensation. Was there any telltale signs when it was out that it was creepy then or was it kind of? I never saw anything. I think he'd stopped offending by the time. I mean, he was in his late seventies when I started to interview him. So I think he, I think, you know, the, the uh, the accusations against him sort of stop before um, you know the time that I'm really interviewing him. So I think he'd probably stop by that stage. But yeah, he was creepy. He said, uh, just said awful things. I mean, I remember on the QE2, like, um, you know, we were like walking along a, a, a corridor, you know, and like there's a couple there. And they're all like, oh, it's Jimmy, Jimmy. And it's like, you know, all this sort of stuff. He goes, yeah, you want to be careful, you know. I'm being chased by underage girls, all this sort of stuff. Again, it's like that sort of, this stuff that would just sort of come out of him. Then you think like, is this like, is this just the sort of weird, not very funny verbal tics, if you like, of somebody who's just sort of like from a completely different age and time? Or is this, like I said, like this sort of Tourette's of the soul where he's sort of coughing it up out of the depths. And there were lots of things like that, just things he'd, he'd say that were just like, what? Why the fuck have you said that? You know, like, you know, there, there just seems to be lots of references to like, um, you know, like you want to be careful, like, you know, to a couple in their sixties, you know, you know, if she's underage, you're going to get in trouble for that. It's like, do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. why, why would you say that? I mean, it's almost like, is he so troubled by the fact that 
I suppose, you know, is it closing in on him? Is it the fact that he knows he's going to die soon because he was pretty unhealthy by the end and, you know, he didn't live a particularly healthy life, um, you know, despite the fact he did all the marathons and the cycling and all that sort of stuff. I think he was fit fit back in the day, but he was ill by, he was an ill man by the end. And he knew that it was all going to come out. He knew it was all going to come out when he died because he had no control of it. That's when the the sort of vice-like grip was was released. Was there anything signed to wait till after his death? Because a lot of high-profile names now where their partner have signed certain agreements where nothing will get released until they're passing. Is that a possibility? Where they waited and waited? Because they have all that information on him and all those accusations and all those victims but nothing coming to light, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me, it doesn't add up, listen, people can make false allegations, but to have so many against him, again, people say, listen, there's people who actually stick up for him, to say he was yeah. never, he was never charged, this and that, listen, they've got a fair point, like, when they talk about dead bodies, and this and that, like, there's never been concrete evidence, and how can you get evidence, with fucking, with a dead body, do you know what I'm saying, the person, why, why would, why would, you know, 500 odd people come forward, yeah, but why never? Why was there never a conviction? It's puzzling. Again, people can go back and forth with the connections and who he was, and was it a lone wolf doing it all himself and creepy? Where there was only word that his word against theirs, and it just what's your whole rundown on why he was never convicted? Because of what we've discussed, I think that he was a lone wolf. I think he he did, as I said, you know that that toxic calculation or combination of fame at a time when you know celebrity was a new thing and the fact that he was this national figure this sort of like the nation's uncle he was jimmy savile of jim will fix it for you know he made kids dreams come true he was a charity fundraiser who had you know rebuilt hospital wings and run the length of Britain and cycle the length of Britain and done all these sort of mad things for charity, always in the public eye for doing things for charity. He was almost untouchable. And I, who would believe, as we've discussed, who would believe a, a patient in a psychiatric hospital, a child in a, in a, you know, in a hospital bed? Who's going to believe that? You know, when Jimmy Subble's like, you know, he puts it all out there anyway. It's like, well, you know, he was, that was the high wire act. I mean, I, you know, I've, I've heard the, I've heard the accusations or the, the, the arguments of people said that, you know, he was never charged, but, you know, I think the weight of evidence and the commonality between the types of offending that he did and the fact that these people didn't know each other and they didn't know what other people had reported. They didn't know that, you know, the type of offending, the sort of quick hit sort of, you know, pulling some girl into a caravan or like thrusting his hand down somebody's trousers or, you know, whatever it was, or pulling somebody into the dressing room at the BBC where it was just him and the other person. Yeah, they didn't, those individual victims didn't know the details of other people's accusations. Did you lose yourself spending time with him trying to get information to write your book in what sense because of the information the things that he says the energy that he brings possibly the accusations that he could be britain's worst ever human being like it must have there must have been sleepless nights i think it was just a lot of there was a lot of frustration at times it just felt like you know the wheels were spinning i didn't feel like as i said like you were getting anywhere i didn't feel like i was getting anywhere and actually when he died i had a real mixture of emotions i hadn't seen him for I hadn't contacted him because, like, the last interview, as I said, he'd said some stuff me, to me that had really troubled me, and I decided to go off and have some time away from him and, and go and sort of try a different track with it. Um, and when he died, I didn't know he was ill, and it was the day before my birthday. My, my, my wife, who was then my girlfriend, had organized uh, a surprise party for me. All my mates were in the pub around the corner, and I was like, I had this total mixture of emotions. I was like, I was upset. I was angry. I was sad. I didn't quite know how I felt, but I, I cried, you know. I was like, you know, part of it was just like, God, I've wasted all that time. I'm nowhere near the truth. And like, he's, he's robbed me of the opportunity to actually get to the truth and, and end this journey. Um, part of it was like sort of 
Christ, I, I don't know how I feel about this. I just don't know how I feel. Because I, I did spend a lot of time with him. And it wasn't all like you are the darkest person yeah. ever. There were times when he could be very entertaining or very interesting or mysterious. I mean, or, you know, slightly funny. Or, but he'd never, he'd never joke about himself. So he took, I always described, you know, being with him as like being in a hall of mirrors. He never quite knew where you were. He kept you off balance. It was almost like that first meeting where he, where he had me frisked against the wall. I'm off balance and, you know, the, the, he's in charge. He's in control. And I think I felt like that for a lot of the process of writing the book. And then, you know, and then I carried on going after he died because I just thought I've got to keep going. And actually it became much easier for me to, to talk to people who were close to him in the inner circle. And then the picture started to emerge. And then I spoke to the guys at Panorama and they told me what they knew. And then I was able to actually direct some of my investigations towards certain areas where I knew I'd find stuff. And then really what I did was I just went over everything I had. I indexed it all. I read it all. I, I catalogued it. And through that process and being able to sort of cross-reference, I went through all the newspaper archives of everything he'd ever appeared in. And you start to see this sort of pattern. And it was like, as I said, this sort of magic eye Feeling it, picture that sort of like emerged out of the blur. And it was like, Christ, this is what it is. And I think that when you talk about losing yourself, I think it's more about after writing the book and after, you know, it, writing it and after it came out and after it, because this, this thing rumbled on for years. It wasn't like over quickly. It was... It, it, the whole scandal run, run on for years, and that took a toll. You know, I think, you know, the, it wasn't so much the time he was alive, it was afterwards thinking, shit, that was, what was that all about? I mean, that was like, why of all the people I could have chosen, if you like, to to investigate or go after to try and find the truth about? Why was it turned out to be one of Britain's worst paedophiles? Why couldn't it have been, you know, one like of the... Faldo. <laughs> yeah Funny like it have been Kenny Dalgleish you know or like Sunas Sunas well maybe a Kenny more than Sunas <laughs> but you know what I mean it's like I, I, and, and I've, I've had those you know yeah. that that's but that, that's understandable because like you say it's one of the biggest scandals maybe not just in the UK but worldwide it's up there as being one of the biggest I don't know if it's a cover up I don't know if the guy was untouchable people say he was born on Halloween he was some sort of wizard listen the speculations are crazy, but you don't genuinely know with this man how deep it goes to how this world operates, to who he's connected to, the secret tunnels, kids going missing, human trafficking, what it had on people, or was a lot of the accusations that falls. Like you, there's so much, and like you say, you worked with him for years to then die and never really getting answers, but then putting the answers together and getting some sort of relief, like, well, this is what I'm saying when you lose yourself, that's losing yourself, because you don't know what the fuck, why did I do it, why did I not have Dalgleish, why me, like, it's a constant battle, and yet, 20 years later, we're still fucking talking about it. Yeah, it is, I mean, you know, there's not, I don't think there's a day that goes past where I think, don't think, like, why him, why, what, what was that all about? But all I can sort of say about it is that my instinct was right, you know, that my... That feeling I had as a nine-year-old in the darkness of a TV theater in Shepherd's Bush watching Jim will fix it being made and coming out feeling sort of like, oh, I'm not sure about this guy. I feel a bit odd about him. I don't like him. I didn't like him. I really hated him growing up. I mean, every time I saw him, I just really, really disliked him. And then he spun me around and had me sort of confused and never quite knew where I stood or where I was going with it. I just knew there was something I knew there was something. Yeah, that must be the hard thing because you've got him at the older age as well, but he's not that flamboyant kind of feel untouchable. He's probably got him at an age where he's more calm, more sinister though, and more calculated with his years of abuse, kind of how he covered it all up. So if you'd got him maybe in his 30s or 40s, it would have been a different story and you'd have got answers quicker because you'd have soon figured out mm, that there's something not right. But as you get older, he's an old man, um, part of times like you say it would have been funny you'd have probably manipulated you probably felt sorry for him sometimes as well even though you know he's a fucking sick but that's just the way the human mind operates so for his inner circle as well what sort of stuff were they saying were they more up front once they passed away because they felt as if there was a bit more security around them like did they no they were worried definitely, definitely yeah. after his death yeah they were worried 
Um, but why? How does it get such power before and after? Well, they, they were worried because, I mean, Ray Terry, I interviewed him, and that was a really bizarre interview. And I said to him, like, you know, I started to find stuff after he died. Like, and obviously I'd spoken to the Panorama guys and I'd spoken to more and more people and, like, it started to come out. People felt like the the shackles were off. People were talking about it. I mean, people, like, who get, went to his dance halls in Manchester and Leeds and stuff like that say, oh, yeah, it was well known. Like, he really liked, he really liked young girls and, like, he'd take them up and all this sort of stuff. And, like, I found a DJ that worked in one of his dance halls in Leeds, I think it was, and he gave me chapter and verse. This guy who, who was sort of a co-manager of the Stones for a while gave me chapter and verse on like what he was doing. And it was suddenly, it was really sort of coming to light. And like I interviewed Terry and I was like, well, so what we do, you know, when you say you were inviting these girls around to the black pad, as it was called in Manchester for tea and fun. I said, what do you mean by tea and fun? Just tea and fun. You know, what do you mean by that? Oh, we just had fun. And it was like, he, he, he'd already served time by that, at that point for, for offences he was worried and there were others that were sort of terrified that they were going to get you know caught up in in this sort of wildfire that and that was even bef- actually even before to be honest with you even before it all came out because it was only it was, it was almost a year after he, he died that it all really came out with the ITV documentary that Mark Williams Thomas did and Mark Williams Thomas had worked with, you know, had done some sort of consultancy work with the Panorama guys. And then he, you know, when the when BBC axed the Panorama investigation, he took it on and he got more and more and more. And I, you know, I was in touch with Mark as well. And like, and then when Mark, when it came out on ITV, which is a very big thing, because like he was still this huge figure. He was still this guy who'd been celebrated and mourned and his 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 achievements had been lauded and all this sort of stuff and that came out and it was huge and then the floodgates sort of opened and like you know mark spoke with i don't know maybe six or seven women on that and yeah i mean i think that i you know a lot of the people i spoke to members of the inner circle before it all came out and after it all came out and they were they were frightened how do you move on from it how do you really? Like- I really want to. I really want to write a book. The next book I want to write. I want to write about somebody who I know is good. <laughs> you can write about me then, brother. <laughs> oh, let's see about that. But I think. I think. I think it's. You know, I knew there was something instinctively about Jimmy Savile that that didn't sit right. I knew there was something there. I'd love to write about somebody who is, who I know is in my heart of hearts is good. I mean, I'm, I've got an idea who that might be, but whether. I get the opportunity to do it or not as another matter, but it would be really nice to, I mean, it is a, it's a book I'm very proud of and it's, it's not quite as, it is dark, obviously. It's not quite as sort of sickening page after page as you might think. I mean, it's a, it is a fascinating study of, 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 as I said, all these things like celebrity and power and control and how he was able to get his way into circles of influence. And it's sort of almost beyond belief. Um, but it is a book I'm proud of, but I think I would love, love to sort of offset it with something that makes me, that, that brings a smile to people's faces rather than making yeah. people think like, oh God. But sometimes you've got to lose yourself in your craft to really separate you from yourself. Now that's a ballsy thing to do. It's not just one interview. It's been years of torture, pain, probably less than happiness as well. What you're doing, never getting answers, trying to get answers. It's like banging yourself, your head ac- across a, a bit brick wall, but there's not many people done it. Now you look at the Louis Ferrou interview. I thought it was a great interview. I thought that, that was a very intriguing documentary. If you actually break it down and look at that from the outside, what's being said, I think Lou was kind of still young and fresh there. Obviously, yourself, you'd probably ask different questions now. You'd probably regret you wish you'd have said this or that. Cause there's never a stone that's not unturned where you'd love to go back in time and think, I should have asked this then. And, you kind of kick yourself, but that interview with Louis was mad as well. Oh yeah, it was so intriguing, but it tells you a lot about him. Yeah, as Louis, well. Louis, Louis, I know Louis, and you know he's a great bloke and and yeah, a great huge, guy. And all huge, Louis, yeah, him online, hugely talented. And like me and Louis have spoken about this on numerous occasions. And Louis is troubled by it. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, he had the same sort of Hall of Mirrors experience. I think with Jimmy Savile that I did. You know, he. he 
couldn't quite work out what he thought about him. He liked him in some cases. He found him entertaining. He was funny. He was curious, mysterious, all this sort of stuff. And he's, I think Louis sort of beating himself up a bit about, you know, why didn't I, why, why didn't I sort of like nail him, you know? And it's like, well, I say to Louis, like, you know, you did an amazing interview that really shone a light on, or you did an amazing piece of TV that shone a light on this very weird old man. And you shone a light on some of the things that, that I really explore in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he's obviously gone back to it and like sort of made TV shows about how he feels about it now and like what he should have done. But I think, you know, my, what I always say to Louis is that, you know, he evaded the police, you know, he evaded, whether it's a vetting of the royal family, he evaded like the, the honours committee, he invaded sort of more powerful people than us. And, you know, you knew there was something there. I mean, I think he, I think he struggled with, he struggled for a while with like the the the, the weight of and the and the number of accusations that came through. But um, yeah, that interview that Louis did, or that that TV show that Louis did, the first one was particularly brilliant. I thought. Yeah, and like you say, it's shedding light on him. He's got away with so much. User only journalists try to do a job or write books. You're not an investigator. You're not fucking FBI. Well, you're going in there. You can't go in there. Same as my interviews. If I was to interview him 20 years ago, I would be, I wouldn't be a fucking this. And you can't, that's not the way interviews work. People just shut off, tell you to fuck off and walk out the door. Yeah. You can't do that. You've got to begin in sort of friendly mentality to kind of break down the barriers and hopefully you break down enough to get information that you need. It takes time. Yeah. It takes time. And, and I, did, did you feel as if you could connect with Louis more because you were kind of on the same boat where... Yeah, I mean, we good to talk. You keep yeah, thing. I think so. And I, th I, I, I sort of first met Louis, interviewed him for a magazine, and he said, "Like, oh, you're the guys doing the Savile book." I, even before it came out, well before it came out, I said, "Yeah," and we obviously talked about that. And then you know, he's made a film with a very, you know, one of my oldest mates directed his Scientology film, actually. So I enjoyed like, that. Yeah, so I know sort of Louis through that, and we've. Yeah, I think that the thing with Samuel is it, it did take a long time. You know, I interviewed him like, like Louis did for days at a time and he had to wait and he had to listen to the same old stories. Often he would be telling a story and he'd, he'd like make out like you'd never heard it before. And I was like almost, you know, listing the words as they came out of his mouth in my mind because I'd heard it three or four times over six, five years, whatever. So you had to wait, you had to be patient. And then sometimes he would reveal something or there'd be a little crack that would appear in the facade and that would let this sort of like view into something beyond and it was a bit of a tantalizing view a lot of the time because once he realized he'd sort of like he 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 sort of showed a bit too much of his hand he he liked to close it down but yeah i mean i think that yeah i mean louis did a great job and it took a lot of time and it was a an episode in my life that um you know, I'm going to take to the, take take to the grave, isn't it? Would you change it anything? Uh, I'd love to have, I'd love to have nailed him while he was alive. I mean, I really would because I am a very firm believer that while he didn't get um, convicted while he was alive, the weight and the nature of the evidence against him and all the inquiries and the findings are too compelling to whether it was all the 500 or whether it was 250 or whether it was 100 you know and i'm not casting aspersions on any of those people you know the fact that he was able to go to his grave on his own terms uh as a free man having wrought that sort of carnage over his life that's my regret do you think that would be truly answers do you think anybody knows the true jimmy savo that's alive um i think lots of people know bits and different bits i think lots of people have different pieces of the jigsaw because he as i said he moved around he didn't want anybody to know the true jimmy savo and that was the thing he did he he, he prevented people from knowing the true jimmy savo i think people had different insights into different aspects of him or witness different parts of him, but nobody had all the pieces to put them together and say, okay, that's the truth. He sort of left them each with a piece or a couple of pieces or, you know, and he, he, he stage managed that, you know, by 
just moving around all the time. Every couple of days, he'd be somewhere else. He'd be in Leeds or Scotland or London or Manchester or wherever it was. Is there many of the victims left? Does yes, came pl- forward? Yeah, there's plenty left, yeah. Do you think anyone will ever get closure? I hope so. I mean, I think that I got a lot of very nice messages after the book came out um, from victims I'd interviewed and victims I hadn't interviewed. Uh, and I was, you know, obviously you, you try to be very careful about this sort of stuff because this is, this is sort of their pain that you're, that you're peeling away. Um, and I think that for some, it helped with that process of closure, but I don't know. I mean, I've not been, I've not been a victim of this sort of abuse, so it's very difficult to put yourself in those shoes. Where do you go forward for the future with it all? Uh, I want to write more books. You know, I think that, that it's, it's hard. I've got three young kids and I've got to pay the bills and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, writing books, unless you, you catch lightning in a bottle and write a huge bestseller, it's not particularly well paid. Certainly didn't get rich out of that. Um, I would love to write more books because, you know, I love writing and I'm a good writer and I feel like that's sort of what I was put on this earth to do. Um, I don't want to write any more books about uh, notorious predatory paedophiles, though. Yeah. Like I say, you're willing to get your hands dirty, though, and you're, I wouldn't say you're a good writer, i say you're a great writer. Like I say, that's a masterpiece in there, whether people think it's dark, great or not, it's all the way it's put together, the way, the, what you had to put yourself through. Like I say, there's not many people do that, so I take my hat off to you because it's unbelievable that you've actually went to try and find information. And then, it's like being an undercover cop, the fucking Donnie Brasco type kind of going in depth. And some people actually spend, remember, if you're spending day on day in, day out with these people, you're going to grow a connection. There's going to be, it's just natural to gravitate towards these people. But like you say, that's just with that name and the profile of him, it's still so intriguing. Netflix documentaries, panorama shows, ITV, books. It's just never ending. And obviously people can now speculate a, of what who he was but who for just before we finish up who do you think he was as an individual just from your own opinion and spending time with him i think he was a, a broken person um from an early age and i think he was a very clever cunning person uh and i think he was a toxic person i think he certainly had a level of regret I mean, that book, God Will Fix It, and what I said to you before about the sort of scales of the good works versus the evil that he talked very openly about meant that he grappled with that. I think the fact that, you know, he was found dead with his fingers crossed suggested that he was worried about what he'd done in this life and what that might have mean for the next life, if indeed you believe in that. So I think he was a, a huge a hugely complex, damaged, uh, poisonous person. But he also, in amongst that, there were other sides of him that that people warmed to, you know. And I think that at the very beginning, we were talking about, um, you know, the impact he's had on other people's lives. There's lots of people that would have taken part in fundraising or charity work or who, who thought they were really doing great things and actually working with Jimmy Savile to raise money for, let's say, Stoke Mandeville or raise money for lifeboats or whatever it might have been that they were doing. That might have been the most exciting thing in their life. And that might have been the greatest times in their life. And I think there's a real, um, there's a real sort of collateral damage for so many people, not just his victims, but those people who now have to view that time in their lives through a totally different lens. It's bad he died with his fingers crossed because the man who was a devil worshipper, um, before he died, he started saying, oh no, what have I done? Really? So whether people believe in that or not, there's definitely something out there, that's, if you ain't doing pretty good in life, if you're an evil bastard, then you're going somewhere else. Yeah, I don't know where that is, I, I don't know. Yeah, I think he knew that, I mean, if he if he was, you know, a true Catholic, and as I said, I'm, I'm not sure how perfectly he practised, I think he must have known that he wasn't going to heaven. Mm-hmm. How are you feeling today? I'm all right. I don't know how I'm going to feel in about half an hour after talking <laughs> about that, but um, I've enjoyed talking yeah. to you. Listen, great conversation. A very dark subject for a lot of people, but it's a subject that must be spoke about too. It's a very popular 
topic, no matter what people think of it, um, a very dangerous man, but also uh, people doted on this man, loved this man, especially with all the charade that he put on and the acting, you know how he worked the crowd, so... Yeah, and there's people genuinely believe he was set up and people believe he was innocent. Listen, the bill means be who you want to be and think how you want to think. The guy was never charged, so it's understandable as well, but you just look at him and you just think, nah, he's a dirty bastard. But again, listen, I could be wrong, especially with information that you have, other people have. Something just doesn't add up. Again, will we ever know? I don't know. But listen, for coming on today and telling your story and writing this book, unbelievable. Like I say, I think you're a great writer. I can't say what you do for the future. Keep going. Would you like to finish up on anything else, Dan? No, that's good, mate. Thanks for your time. And again, where can people buy your book, Dan? Uh, you can get In Plain Sight on Amazon, all good bookshops. It's still out there. God bless you, mate, and I wish you all the best for the future. Cheers, James. Cheers.